Tes, tes. Tes, tes. Tes, tes.
Ladies and gentlemen, the opening ceremony is going to start in five minutes. Please be prepared. We would also like to remind all presenters to change your Zoom name into room number, underscore your Senfar ID, underscore name. name. For example, example 01 zero one underscore SBD zero one underscore Faiz Fairuza. And for participants, please change your Zoom account's name into room number underscore name. For example, zero one underscore Faiz Fairuza. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning, ladies. We would also like to remind all presenters again to change your Zoom name 
name into your room your number, room number room underscore, underscore, send part ID, underscore, underscore, name. For example, For example zero, one, zero, one, underscore, underscore SB, SB, zero, one, underscore, Faiz Fairuza. And for participants, please change your Zoom account's name into room number underscore name. For example, zero one underscore Faiz Fairuza. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me, Faiz Fairuza and Hadija Lamabila. We are both students from architecture program at Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. We are so grateful to be here in this wonderful morning, and we are very delighted to welcome all of you to the 20th International Conference of Sustainable Environment and Architecture, SENFAR 20, organized by the Architecture Department of Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. This event this is hosted by the Ministry of Research, Research and Technology, and Technology, Technology, and Technology or BRIN, BRIN and, and International, International Building Performance Building Simulation, Simulation Association, Association IBIPSA, IBIPSA Indonesia. Indonesia. This conference brings scholars, researchers, researchers practitioners, practitioners, decision makers, makers students, students, and stakeholders, as well as city activists together to elaborate a integrated discussion. To share the idea, research, and study about urban environmental changes. The video that we are going to watch is the profile of our beloved department of architectural education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. The Department of Architectural Education was established in 2006 and is the result of expanding the Department of Building Engineering Education. The Department of Architectural Education is one of the departments under the Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education. Until now, the Department of Architectural Education consists of two undergraduate study programs the Architectural Education and the Architecture Study Program. Our vision is to be a leading and outstanding institution in the field of architectural education. Both of undergraduate study programs have been accredited with the predicate A by the National Accreditation Body for Higher Institution. In 2020, the Department of Architectural Education also opened a postgraduate program on a master's level, covering both research and architectural design. To adapt to the Industrial Revolution 4.0, the department incorporates advanced technology, fast knowledge, and the local wisdom into the learning process to ensure that all graduates from the Department of Architectural Education practice a responsible role in the society and ready to contribute to the advancement in the built environment industry, architectural education, and other related fields.
Our lecturers and students also have been actively involved in various national and international events, competitions, and programs, which enrich our learning experience and improve the quality of our education. All right, that was the profile of Department of Architectural Education of Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Now, for a brief moment, we would like to invite you to rise and sing the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. For those of you who are here in this room, you may stand up and sing with us. Thank you so much. You may return to your seat. And now we would like to ask all of you to please stand silently for a moment of reflection and respect. Words cannot express the tremendous grief our nation is experiencing over the tragedy of the past months. We mourn the tragic loss of lives and injuries and our deepest sympathies go out to the health workers, the lost lives, their families and friends due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We commend the heroic actions and courage of the essential workers, volunteers, and government officials. And as we struggle to return to normalcy, we look to the wisdom of our national leaders who are resolved to not allow this event to change our way of life or restrict our freedoms. In the words of our congressional leaders, we, the people of Indonesia and the whole world, We'll stand united as our nation, as I will begin the process of recovery. Please join us in a moment of silence. Let the moment of silence begin. Thank you. 
Thank you. May everything we have prayed upon become the truest form of blessings as we try to recover to the normal life. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to listen to the welcoming speech from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia's Rector, which will be represented by the Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs, Professor Didi Sukiyadi. We would also like to ask Professor Didi to open this conference. To Professor Didi, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, the honorable plenary speakers, the honorable organizing committee, the honorable uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, Senfar seminar and welcome to Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. And on behalf of OP Rector, Professor Solehuddin, uh, I can pay the warmest greeting to all of you. And hopefully in this pandemic situation, we can uh, stay healthy and uh, Although we are limited by some of the uh, COVID protocol, but we can be uh, more productive. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank especially Ibu Beta and also the organizing committee uh, who are already uh, working hard to organize uh, this uh, seminar. It is not easy to keep the seminar going on from time to time. So I really appreciate the uh, effort and work hard. I do hope that uh, this seminar will be continuously organized from year to year with more uh, participants, with more uh, speakers coming from many different countries. And I also expect that the uh, papers from this conference can be organized in such a way that it will become a piece of uh, work that can be distributed all over the world, not only nationally, but also internationally. Thirdly, I would like also to thank Ibu Beta and also the Honorable Dean of Faculty of uh, Technology and Vocational Education and also the Vice Deans uh, who have already uh, worked hard uh, to keep the collaboration working on. Uh, especially what Ibu Beta has been done with Florida State University. Uh, we have some colleagues uh, who have already visited UP, especially uh, Professor Rafi. Uh, is uh, Pak Rafi here in this uh, meeting, in this seminar, Ibu Beta? And hopefully uh, he is here with us. And I know also that uh, some of the uh, the speakers uh, are from uh, United States and also from other countries. Uh, thank you all. And thank you also for the collaboration in terms of Cool Group uh, program. We know that Ibu Beta has uh, got a project from United Nations uh, to uh, decrease the emission zero by using the technology of, uh, uh, provided and uh, help assisted by uh, the consortium. And one of the member of the consortiums is Florida State University. And the technology has also been transferred to our colleagues, Ibu Beta, so we can create uh, our own technology later in the future. And uh, now we have already painted some uh, buildings in some cities. And 
based on the uh, observation, uh, we can uh, significantly decrease the emission zero, especially for buildings with air conditioner in big cities like in Tangerang and in other hot cities. Uh, I expect that uh, the same project can also be continued in the future in the form of uh, competitive fund or matching grant from the government. So we urge Ibu Beta uh, and also uh, her colleagues uh, from the faculty to work together uh, to prepare a proposal uh, to be sent to our government. Because so far, uh, the government has already stated three ways of funding universities. The first one is through what we call uh, key performance indicator achievement. The second one is through matching fund. The matching fund can be organized and can be done with industries. And the third one is using what we call competitive fund in which we have to pursue excellence and achievement in eight key new performance indicators that have already been issued by our Directorate General of Higher Education, one of which is collaboration with universities. So uh, collaboration between universities and industries. So I think uh, we cannot avoid, we cannot uh, hide from collaboration with uh, industries with uh, institutions, whether government institution or private institution, because uh, we are encouraged to close, uh, to, to make the relation between universities and industries closer. So through this seminar, I think we can uh, build our networking, we can build our relationship, we can build our collaboration uh, with many different parts, whether with industries, whether with government institution, uh, with schools, and also with research uh, institution, whether from our country or from other countries. So again, uh, thank you very much for uh, being here with us in this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, uh, hopefully that this uh, webinar can be a venue for us to share our expertise to share our wisdom, to share our knowledge, and also to share our experiences. Uh, we hope that we can get a good diet, uh, healthy diet from this seminar, diet for our mind, diet for our uh, thinking, from our ideas, and also for our intelligence. So on behalf of our uh, rector, uh, we and uh, myself, the Vice Rector for uh, Education and Student Affairs, uh, officially open this webinar by saying or reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much. Thank you to all plenary speakers. And if it is not in a pandemic situation, we would kindly invite you to have dinner or lunch with us, uh, but I believe that Ibu Beta will give you something more special. Uh, and uh, if we have finished this uh, pandemic, if we have overcome this pandemic, I welcome you all to Bandung and you will be my guest. Uh, you will be our guest. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Ridi Sekiadi, for your speech and for opening the conference. Now, we are going to invite the chair of SENPAR 20, Dr. Engbeta Paramita, to deliver the conference report. To Ibu Beta, the time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to SENFAR 20. It's my pleasure to walk you through the conference, introduce you to the speaker and delegates that have come from all over the country today to share their knowledge and enhance and our mental horizon.
Today's conference has about 300 participants participating from 14 different countries across the world and held this conference online. We are facing the challenge on 14 different time zones from east to west. As you may see in my screen, that there are Indonesia with 222 participants, Malaysia, 10 participants, USA, 9 participants, Thailand, 8 participants, UEA, 7 participants, Argentina, 3, India, Japan, Korea, also 3 participants, Germany, 1 participant, Turkey, 1 participant, Vietnam, one participant, and the last one, Australia, with, with the one participant. Thank you for all your effort to join this conference. I do really appreciate it. Sanfar was founded in 2000 by a group of architecture lecturers who have an interest in sustainability and building science. This conference has come a long way since 2000 from the first until 20, Senfar has bridged the opportunity of scholar, researcher, practitioner, decision maker, as well as city activists to share their idea and study about environmental change. Senfar has become an important part spreading the knowledge, especially for sustainable architectural design in a built environment. I would like to dedicate Senfar 20 as a tribute to respected and our beloved teachers. This year, this conference holds special value because this is the first conference in the history of SANFAR when the conference is taking place on a digital platform due to the changing time caused by the COVID-19. Thus, this conference would like to contribute to the better world by taking them urban retrofitting, building cities and community in the destructive era. I would like to extend my gratitude to the Ministry of Research or BRIN and IBIPSA Indonesia for supporting this conference. Also to the office, the Vice Rector for Research, International Cooperation and Business to make this conference is possible to be held. For the keynote speaker who have different time zone with us, but still providing their precious time to deliver their speech, for Professor Chime Anumba, Dean of the College of Design, Construction and Planning, University of Florida, Kurt Sigman, an Executive Director of Global Cool City Alliance, Professor Andreas Matsarakis from Research Center Human Biometeorology of, the, of German Meteorological Service. Also to Professor M.S. Barliana, the Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education UP. Thank you for your time to join our conference. Not to forget to mention Professor Hamdan Ahmad from UTM, Professor Rafi Sinunifasan from University of Florida, Associate Professor Pawini Iam Trakul from Tamasat University, Associate Professor Ted Sukobota from Hiroshima University, Associate Professor Bao Jihe from UNSW for taking part as an invited speakers. The last but not least, the participant who took the time and thought to write we have total 125 submitted full paper from 297 submitted abstract previously. The well-known reviewer who take serious input and comment so the article are able to publish in the reputable publication. We did the double blind review for all article and there are 20 selected articles that will be submitted to Journal of Applied Science and Engineering and 50 15 selected articles that will be submitted to Geographica Panonica. Also 90 articles that will be submitted to IOP conference series. Finally, I would like to express my highest appreciation to the chairman of the Department of Architectural Education, Ibu Dr. Lilis Widaningsi, for enormous support, my colleague and my student who have devoted all their thought and energy to make this conference run successfully. Finally, I would like to say enjoy this conference and have a fruitful discussion. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the report, Ibu Beta. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Here, we already have all of the keynote speakers with us. Now, while we wait for them to prepare for the keynote session, please enjoy this and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear participants, Dear participants, and speakers, distinguished guests, distinguished guests, we are now entering yeah, now the entering. keynote session one. We have here with us Professor Chimai Anumba and the Dean of the College of Design, Construction and Planning at the University of Florida. Kurt Schickman, the Executive Director of Global Cool Cities Alliance and Professor Xiao Marliana, the Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education at Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Ibu Ilham Dania, PhD, will be the moderator of this keynote session one. Now, I'm going to read the curriculum vitae of Ibu Ilham Dania, PhD. Ilham Dania, PhD, is a lecturer at Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. She got her Bachelor of Architecture at Institute of Technology Bandung, Indonesia, at the year of 2000. She got her Master of Engineering in Urban Housing, Institute of Technology Bandung, Indonesia at the year of 2003. She got her Master of Science in Urban Planning and Management at Faculty of ITC, University of Twente, the Netherlands at the year of 2005. She got her Doctor of Philosophy, PhD in Urban and Regional Planning at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, School of Architecture and Urban Planning, the State, University of New York at Buffalo, United States at the year of 2019. Her research interests are urban planning, urban housing, geographic information system or GIS, and architecture. So Yabu Ilham Dania, the time is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Master of Ceremony, for the introduction. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greetings to all our conference guests, fellow participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank for the opportunity to become the moderator of this keynote session. It is indeed an honor. Let's begin our keynote speaker session today. We are honored to have three prominent scholars and practitioners in this session to deliver their speeches and share their expertise with us. The first to deliver the speech, we have Professor Chime Anumba. He is the Dean of College of Design, Construction and Planning, University of Florida, United, Florida, States. United States. Our second speaker, Our second speaker who will share his experience with us, with us Mr. Kurt Sherman, Executive Director of Global Cool Cities Alliance, United States. And for our third keynote speaker, will be Professor M. Shaum Barliana, our Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. So for our first session, we are pleased to welcome Professor Chimai Anumba, 
I believe he's already here with us, virtually joining from Florida, United States. Professor Anumba has a very extensive list of experience in his curriculum today, covering scholarly activities and achievements over the course of his career. Please allow me to briefly highlight some of them here. He is currently the Dean of College of Design, Construction and Planning, University of Florida, United States. He attained his PhD in Civil Engineering, specializing in computer-aided design from University of Leeds, United Kingdom. He is indeed a very prolific scholar, proven by his fascinating number of publications. He has written 500 scientific publications, including 20 books and 200 archival journal papers. In terms of research, he has been granted over 150 million US dollar of research grants. Those grants are awarded from prestigious research grant sources, such as National Science Foundation, US Department of Energy, National Institute of Health, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in UK, and a variety of international agencies. His research interest is pertinent to construction engineering and management and advanced engineering informatics. Shortly, he will, he will be sharing with us his expertise relevant to our CENFAR 20 conference theme, which is urban retrofitting, buildings, cities, and communities in the disruptive era. Professor Anumba, please deliver your speech in 30 minutes, and we will have a question and answer session after all keynote speakers deliver their speeches. Participants are welcome to ask questions by typing your question in the chat box and indicating to whom the question is addressed. With that, I would kindly ask our audience to give full attention to Professor Anumba's presentation and help me welcome him to deliver his speech. Professor Anumba, please. Can you see my screen? Are you able to see my screen now? Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to um, participate in this conference. I must say I'd rather be over there with you, uh, but I'll have to visit at some other date uh, when travel restrictions are relaxed. So today um, I want to share with you some of what we are doing in the area of built environment resilience and why uh, it's a critical part of sustainable development. Um, so I have a number of slides which I'll try to go through fairly quickly, and then we can take some questions at the end. So just by way of an outline, I'll make some introductory remarks and introduce some concepts. I'll talk about some of the approaches that we are adopting, and then I'll speak specifically about an initiative that we started here at the University of Florida, uh, re focusing on built environment resilience, and then give an example of a resilience project that has been undertaken and summarized. For those of you not very familiar with the University of Florida, we are currently ranked number six in US public research universities, and we have a population of about 50,000 students. Right now, um, 
a lot of the work that I'll describe is centered within my college, uh, the College of Design, Construction and Planning, uh, which is one of 16 colleges uh, within the university. So going on to my presentation, um, the context really is the fact that uh, all over the world, many countries are experiencing extreme weather and climate events, and the U.S. is certainly not immune from that. Uh, and this is just an example from 2017. Uh, we had about 16 separate weather and climate events, uh, each of which cost over a billion dollars. And a lot, a lot of these events obviously re, um, resulted in losses in billions of dollars, as well as a lot of fatalities. Uh, some of those range from uh, fires in California, some flooding. Uh, we also had a number of hurricanes. Uh, to the south of the of the country, and then a number of tornadoes and also um, severe storms in various places. So this is really one of the, the context for the work that we're trying to do. And what we are focusing on is the concept of resilience. And there are lots of different ways you can look at resilience. Um, the general definition is really looking at it from the point of view of the ability to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. And this could be deliberate attacks, accidents, or naturally occurring threats or incidents. If you use an engineering perspective, then we are really talking about the ability of a material or system to bend or resist without breaking and the speed at which it returns or bounces back to equilibrium after a displacement. And I've included a number of references there. Uh, in psychology, they talk about the process ability or capacity of individuals and communities uh, to re resist, recover and return to baseline functioning after a misfortune, stress or external shock. And a very simple way I'd like to look at resilience is the idea of bounce back ability. That's the capacity of a city or a community or an environment to bounce back to its previous uh, situation prior to whatever the uh, external um, hazard or impact is. So in our case, uh, we are not just interested in resilience generally, we are particularly interested in built environment resilience, which is really about the, uh, the response of the built environment to uh, some of these adverse events. And if you look at what exactly constitutes the built environment, we're talking about the parts of the planet uh, that are most directly shaped by human activity uh, and with a specific focus on the places where people live, work, or recreate. And um, Britton Purdy from C Columbia University uh, estimates that for every human being, uh, there are over 1,000 tons of built environment in terms of roads, office buildings, power plants, transit systems, and so on. And so another area that we are focusing on is the whole area of infrastructure. Um, and we look at it as being the basic physical or organizational structure needed for the operation of society or enterprise, all the services and facilities necessary for an economy to function. And our contention is that the most resilient systems are actually designed uh, to remain unaffected by hazardous situations. And this is very important when you start to look at the critical infrastructure that uh, sustains our economic activity and our human activities. So at the University of Florida, we are focusing on the resilient built environment, infrastructure, looking at cities, looking at communities, 
And some of the examples that I'll show will give you uh, an indication of the scale uh, at which we are working. Um, so one of the main areas that is of interest uh, to the government here is really what is regarded as critical infrastructure. And so those are those asset systems and networks uh, that are so vital that their incapacitation and destruction would have a debilitating effect on security, national economic security, national public health or safety or any combination thereof. And so a number of industry sectors have been identified as being critical. Um, and I won't go through this whole list, uh, but we're talking about chemical, uh, commercial, communications, manufacturing, uh, physical facilities such as dams, emergency services, energy, transportation systems, uh, healthcare and public health, food and agriculture, and a whole range of things. And so it, it means that in order to look carefully at um, built environment resilience, we need to uh, have an understanding of what are the critical infrastructure systems that we need to uh, protect. And in looking at that, it's important also to recognize that these infrastructure systems uh, do not exist in isolation. Uh, there's a great deal of interdependencies between them and that affects their resilience capacity. And so being able to understand that is very important. And so, for example, a flooding event can take roads, bridges, electricity substations out of commission, uh, resulting in unanticipated problems such as food shortages. So understanding and modeling these uh, interdependencies are really very important in facilitating what if analysis and simulations, uh, which are critical for a resilient response to both natural and man-made hazards. And so what this means is that you need a multidisciplinary approach. And in our case, we are uh, looking at adopting a system of systems type approach uh, as that allows us to conceptualize these infrastructure systems in a way that we can more readily uh, address the critical issues. So when we talk about a uh, system of systems approach, we are really looking at a resilient built environment being consisting of several interacting subsystems. And this ab abstract illustration just shows how you can have a whole <clears throat> series of uh, subsystems that are linked in one way or the other. And the idea of uh, looking at the built environment as a system of systems allows us to do a number of things. Uh, one of those is really to explore how best to decompose a city or region into a system of systems, and then how we can understand what are the interdependencies uh, between these different infrastructure systems. And kind of related to that is how then do you def, uh, design uh, the interfaces uh, between these subsystems to ensure both synergy and resilience? And then how best you ensure not just uh, synergy between the systems, but also between the built systems, but also between the built systems and the natural environment. And then we also have to look at how to integrate the physical, technological, and human systems, because uh, these in, um, infrastructure systems do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, there are people that use these uh, systems, and there, are a lot of, there, there is a lot of technology, or there are lots of technological systems that are um, embedded or interoperate uh, with these systems. And with all of that, we need to understand the, these interdependencies so we can avoid what people generally re refer to as unintended 
or imagined consequences. And that is the only way we're able to deal with this. Uh, if you look at many cities, you'll find that um, a lot of the infrastructure is aging. And so um, if we understand the interdependencies, then it helps us to uh, plan how to phase, scope, and coordinate uh, the renewal or repair of these uh, systems. And that's just a little uh, indication of what is what we need to be able to do. So if you start to look at critical infrastructure component systems, you can look at it in terms of uh, the transportation system, food supply, the utilities, electricity, water, gas, uh, industry generally, uh, communication, education, healthcare, buildings, banking and finance and so on. So there's a whole lot of component systems we need to be. Uh, interested in. And uh, I just like to highlight the importance of buildings because uh, very often people don't pay attention uh, to buildings because they are vital to all infrastructure systems. Uh, people are said to spend up to 90% of their time in buildings, uh, be it the offices, recreational facilities, or other. Um, other places. And then, of course, all infrastructure systems interface with buildings at some level. Uh, most utilities are housed in buildings. Uh, we have transportation systems and hubs that are situated in buildings. Healthcare, educational, financial, and other facilities are housed in buildings. Uh, so it, it does um, make buildings really important. Uh, in terms of when we're looking at built environment re resilience. And of course, uh, you also have buildings, housing, social amenities, uh, which are important for community well-being. And even in disaster situations, uh, we typically rely on buildings to offer shelter, safety, and security. So the Benefits of understanding these interdependencies include having the potential for uh, a lot of social benefits, uh, better amenities, reduced crime, greater inclusion, community development, as well as the opportunities for synergistic benefits uh, when you undertake um, uh, these within a system of systems perspective. And of course, when you understand the interdependencies, then you can have increased resilience of the built environment. And this is typically more important at urban uh, scale. Also, it's important to recognize that the natural environment can work in concert uh, with the built environment to enhance resilience. And a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, planners and resilience experts now focus on the uh, interaction uh, between the natural environment and the built environment to address issues such as sea level rise uh, in a lot of uh, coastal cities. So at the University of Florida in recognition of this, uh, in the importance of built environment resilience, we have uh, created a new research institute uh, which we call FIBA, and that stands for the Florida Institute for Built Environment Resilience. Uh, and up there, you can see the website. Um, and uh, this we founded about three years ago, and we had a whole bunch of um, faculty and researchers, and I'll talk a little bit more about what each of them uh, does to give you a flavor for uh, where we are going with this. Um, but the external drivers to us actually starting this was uh, to look at how we can contribute to the uh, built environment re response to climate change impacts. We're also using this to address a number of UN sustainable development goals, uh, contribute to the smart cities initiatives uh, that are in the US and elsewhere. And then also the National Academy of Engineering has a number of grand challenges 
uh, one of which relates to restoring and improving urban infrastructure. Uh, and a part of that talks about good design and advanced materials uh, contributing to improving transportation and energy, water and waste systems, and creating more sustainable urban environments. Uh, in addition to this, there are a number of uh, initiatives at state, municipal, and community uh, resilience levels uh, that we are uh, wanting to contribute to. And so the vision really is that we, uh, fiber will, be, will become a focal point for research and education on built environment resilience and be a key global player in advancing resilience in the built environment, uh, facilitate collaboration between our college and other institutes at the University of Florida, as well as international collaboration with related research centers, institutes, and initiatives in leading global universities. And so we'll be looking to partner with you uh, in this area. So a number of uh, related entities at the University of Florida, uh, in terms of colleges, we are looking to, uh, we are collaborating with the uh, College of Engineering because they have a civil and coastal engineering uh, department. We also have computing and information science. Um, and then we'll, we have the Institute for Food and Agricultural Sciences, IFAS, uh, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, where we have a lot of the climate change scientists. And then the law school, uh, the medical sciences, uh, medical and health sciences, and the business. All of these have a keen interest in aspects of resilience. Uh, we also have the Florida Climate Institute and the Florida Water Institute, and then the UF Transportation Institute. And these are just a few examples. Uh, within the college, we have a number of uh, research centers that are addressing different aspects of, um, of the built environment, some more closely associated with resilience than others. Uh, so we have a Center for Community Innovation that works with communities, Center for Health and the Built Environment, Center for Hydro Generated Urbanism, International Center for Adaptation Planning and Design, Center for Advanced Construction Information Modeling, and a Geoplan Center that holds a lot of the uh, geospatial information uh, that relates to the state of Florida. We have a Shinbeck Center for Affordable Housing, and then a Center for World Heritage Research and Stewardship. So all of these uh, partner with Fiber to address the issues of uh, built environment resilience. And so what are the initial research areas we are looking at? Uh, we are looking at uh, four broad areas. One is looking at landscapes and communities in terms of embedded resilience, innovative urban design solutions urban metabolism, impact of climate change. Uh, with regard to infrastructure systems, we're looking at distributed energy systems, socio-technical system design, uh, design of transportation systems, critical infrastructure systems. And then with regard to buildings and facilities, looking at design for wellness and productivity, use of renewable resources, and innovative materials research. And then in terms of technology, we're looking at doing a lot of modeling and simulation, looking at all of those uh, sorts of what if scenarios that I talked about, uh, but also looking at um, advancing systems thinking and system of systems approaches, uh, looking at in intelligent and smart systems. Uh, our university has recently made a huge investment of $70 million on artificial intelligence. And so we will see uh, that contributing also to this uh, initiative. And I have a number of uh, professors who are working on smart cities, and that includes uh, Professor Srini Vassan, who is uh, on the call on the conference. So some of the main fa uh, faculty that we have hired uh, include uh, David Hulse, who's uh, 
has a background in landscape architecture and does a lot of um, spatial decision support systems, river basin modeling, as well as uh, modeling of fire hazards. Uh, Jeff Carney focuses on coastal resilience, adaptive design, sustainability, and flooding. Jason von Medin looks at disaster response and management, uh, socioeconomic impacts of disasters. Tim Martha does landscape simulation and modeling. Ryan Shaston does building modeling and performance, uh, including in the environmental quality. Dr. Yan Wang does uh, work on disaster resilience and urban computing. And Dr. Lisa Platt does work on system dynamics, interior design and resilience systems. I have a number of postdocs and uh, doctoral students within the institute. So looking more specifically at some of the details of the work being done, uh, one of these areas is uh, with, Dr., uh, with uh, David Hulse, who's looking at trajectories of change and alternative futures. Uh, and in this particular example, he's been focusing on uh, futures modeling related to certain areas in the Northwestern part of the U United States. Uh, Jeff Carney has been looking at uh, working on aspects of coastal resilience, uh, looking at visualization and communication, community engagement, as well as design uh, research. Uh, Jason von Medin has been looking at communicating about disasters and how that the narrative behind a number of these uh, disasters uh, can change and influence how we look at them and how we formulate appropriate responses. Uh, as I said, uh, Tim Murtha has been looking at the resilience of cities and landscapes, uh, focusing particularly in, in Latin America. Uh, Yan Wong has been focusing on complex uh, resilient cities and um, urban computing and being able to track detect and track the crisis that occurs in hurricanes. Some of this is through tracking um, social media feeds uh, on Twitter and also other uh, social media. And then Ryan Shaston has been looking at uh, adaptation issues, uh, particularly adaptive built environments uh, and in particular uh, the building envelope. Uh, and looking at shading devices and how those can improve uh, adaptation. Uh, so in addition to some of the fiber faculty, we've had some other work uh, by some of our colleagues in the uh, School of Architecture. Uh, Professors Martha Cohen and Nancy Clark uh, run the Center for Hydro-Generated Urbanism, and they've been doing some work in Puerto Rico uh, following the devastation of uh, Hurricane Maria and the recent earthquakes. And so they've uh, done some work trying to come up with, um, with how best to uh, redesign uh, the, the island to be more resilient and to bounce back from those uh, immediate hazards. So they have held a lot of workshops out there in Puerto Rico and have provided uh, guidance to both emergency planners as well as the, the local and municipal governments and communities. And then uh, Professor Jean Ren Pong has been looking at, uh, particularly in the Florida area, how to go from um, vulnerability assessment of different communities uh, to coming up with, the, with uh, adaptation plans. And these uh, look at the uh, some of the business issues in addition to what the impacts are on urban development and then what are the best uh, adaptation strategies uh, to help improve uh, the situation for the community. And so these are just some um, models they have done uh, focusing on a particular area, Bay County in Florida. And with that, they come up with um, a number of adaptation strategies, one of which could be business as usual or business as usual with 
a population relocation strategy uh, and, and a whole series of other options. Excuse me, Professor okay. Anumka. We would like to remind you that your time will be five more minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, I'll wrap up with this example of a resilience project. Uh, this was done by uh, a number of our colleagues here, um, looking at a looking at a city called Cedar Key in Florida, and Cedar Key, as you can see on this map, is on the west coast of Florida. is a little bit uh, about two hours drive from Gainesville, where the University of Florida is, and you can see it's uh, pretty um, surround, pretty much surrounded by water. And so, any problem, any issues with sea level rise, uh, going to have a significant impact on this community. So, our colleagues uh, have some pictures from I think over a hundred years ago. And this is what one of the main streets looked like. And uh, this is a more recent picture that shows what it looks like currently. And they were trying to model the impact of a certain amount of sea level rise on this uh, main street in Cedar Key. Uh, and so this is um, Professor Marty Hilton uh, with his laser scanner capturing uh, the uh, the situation in the, in the downtown part of Cedar Key. And then based on that, they looked at a number of uh, sea level rise scenarios and came up with predictions as to how much sea level, this, how much impact a storm surge of a certain level would, um, would um, impact the city. And they came up with this uh, visualization that actually shows uh, what would happen. Uh, in addition to, to the computer simulations, they build physical models, uh, which they shared with the local community uh, to show exactly how uh, the water impact would impact the community. And then this is, these are actual pictures from what happened. The study was done in March. 2016, and in September 2016, we had Hurricane Hermin, <clears throat> which impacted the city of uh, Cedar Key, and it was, our model was shown to be about 96% accurate in terms of exactly where the water went and the level to which it has risen. And we are, based on this, we are now working with a number of uh, coastal communities in Florida to come up with their resilience plans and their adaptation strategies. So to conclude, uh, resilience is a critical aspect of sustainable development. Uh, we don't think that there's adequate focus on the built environment resilience aspects in many um, studies. Uh, we are trying to address this uh, through this new research institute uh, by envisioning future scenarios conceptualizing planning, design and construction solutions, coming up with novel disaster management approaches, uh, utilizing urban computing to monitor events in real time, formulating long-term master plans for sustainable cities and proposing adaptation strategies for sea level rise and other hazards. And we are looking to collaborate with other uh, universities and um, organizations around the world that have an interest in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Anumba, for your elaborate and informative presentation. Uh, the presentation was about the built environment resilience toward climate change, and he's highlighting the importance of critical infrastructure and building resilience in and the interdependencies between the system. Uh, he also introduced about uh, fiber, Florida Institute of Building Environment. And this is opening opportunities for collaboration among network of our conference participants and uh, institutions. Thank you very much again, Professor Anumba. Um, now we we'll move forward to our second speaker. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Kurt Schickman joining us from Washington DC, United States. 
Welcome here, Mr. Kurt Schickman. Please allow me to briefly introduce his background and experience. Mr. Schickman is a seasoned practitioner in the field of sustainable environment, energy, and climate. He earned his Master of Art degree in International Relations and Economics from John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Currently, he is an executive director of Global Cool Cities Alliance, Washington, DC. And previously, he was a director of research, energy, and climate in Energy Future Coalition, United States. So in this occasion, he will be sharing with us his work and expertise pertinent to passive cooling strategies for a warming world. Mr. Schickman, please deliver your speech in 30 minutes and we will have a question and answer session after all keynote speakers deliver their speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome Mr. Schickman to deliver his speech. Mr. Schickman? this opportunity is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, uh, Professor Paramita in particular for your work and the, our work together uh, and being able to share a little bit of that today and greetings from Washington, DC. Um, I'm going to uh, just first introduce my organization as we may not be a, a household name, uh, the Global Cool Cities Alliance is a nonprofit that was, is based in the United States. It works with cities and communities to implement passive cooling strategies to build a resilience to rising temperatures. We launched in 2011, and we grew out of the work of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Heat Island Group in California. And the idea was to take what we knew about the research and the benefits of, of uh, heat mitigation and passive cooling in particular, uh, and, and making sure that uh, cities had what they needed to uh, overcome the unique challenges of heat and some of the unique implementation barriers that, that we face when we try to mitigate that heat. Uh, we manage a network of 40 cities. It's a peer exchange network called the Cool Cities Network, and you can see uh, most of them here on the red dots on the map on the, on the right-hand side. We also work directly with certain cities to develop and implement heat mitigation and resilience policies. Uh, and we work indirectly also th with through national governments, uh, the government of South Africa, Japan, India, uh, Brazil, and the United States. Uh, in addition to that, with development banks such as the World Bank and the IFC uh, and certain UN agencies uh, and, and other uh, international organizations to uh, ensure that their work also incorporates uh, the, the issues related to heat and, uh, and the sort of challenge of the, of the current cooling crisis that we, face, we, we currently face. Uh, we're also supporting a program uh, called the Million Cool Roofs Challenge, uh, which is it, it was established to uh, help build markets uh, for cool roofs, uh, which I'll talk about as a, sort of a key passive cooling uh, measure in 10 countries, uh, which have an acute uh, need for access to cooling services, either now or in the very near future. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, as, I, as I proceed here. So I'd like to cover a few topics related to passive cooling and the built environment. And these are lar largely drawn from a new primer uh, from the World Bank that we were the lead author for. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to be focusing really on the first four points mostly. Uh, but if you're interested in, in policy and policy development and case studies uh, in terms of what cities and communities are doing now, uh, you might find the primer interesting. Uh, so I'm really gonna to focus today on uh, why cooling is such a critical development issue uh, for the, in this century and what passive cooling solutions are cities currently implementing uh, and where are, they op where are they applicable, where are they optimal uh, and how do they perform and what do they cost? Uh, I'll also be looking at the barriers that we see to implementing uh, passive cooling at scale because despite what you'll hear about the urgency and the opportunity uh, there we still have a long way to go towards implementation implementation and making sure uh, that cities and communities have access to these to these passive cooling measures so we'll look at a little bit at that and then i'll focus uh, on what cities and or, and what countries are doing uh, right now uh, to help build up their uh, ability to uh, uh, be resilient to heat with a particular focus on the million cool roofs challenge so 
we see really three large scale trends uh, that have combined to rapidly raise temperatures in cities and to increase the number of people that are negatively affected by that rise. And the first on the left here, cities are growing rapidly in physical size and population. And this is especially the case in Asia and Africa. We anticipate that by 2030, uh, our cities will be 80% larger than they are today. And a substantial amount of that urban expansion, about, about 40%, will occur in informal and unplanned areas where temperatures are high, construction is substandard and does not protect residents from heat stress, and residents lack access to services and support to improve their resilience to heat, and finally, where there are limited economic opportunities in, in general. And the second major trend is the planet is heating up due to the effects of atmospheric greenhouse gases. For most of human history, humans have lived in climates characterized by a mean annual temperatures of between 11 and 15 degrees Celsius. But by 2070, one in every three people will, worldwide will live in far hotter conditions with mean annual temperatures of more than 29 degrees Celsius. So roughly double uh, what we've experienced over most of human history. Now, to put that in perspective, about 1% of the planet now currently exists uh, in these conditions. And the third macro trend here is urban design. Uh, our urban design and materials choices, as you can see here uh, on the right, including dark urban surfaces, the uh, relative lack of vegetation compared to rural areas, human generated heat, waste heat, and urban design that, that blocks wind and, and, uh, and uh, helps trap heat. These all uh, combine to uh, create uh, urban air temperatures that are consistently higher than nearby rural temperatures. And this is largely known as a phenomenon called the urban heat island effect, which you, you may be familiar with. Uh, and in addition to being just generally hotter air temperatures in cities versus uh, rural areas, these temperatures are rising at twice the rate of global average climate change. So in short, we have more and more people moving to, to places uh, that are getting hotter and hotter. Now, rising temperatures and increasing frequency and intensity of extreme heat events put stress on nearly every urban system. And I've listed some here, but these stresses can be considered kind of more broadly in four categories. First, stress on infrastructure. Extreme heat events put pressure on electric generation, transmission, and distribution systems. They can potentially overwhelm hospitals, damage roads and rails, uh, and impede flights of larger aircraft in certain conditions. The second category I'd say here is stress on humans. Uh, the rising temperatures have a major direct and indirect effect on human health and well being. It can lead to higher rates of violent and property crime, reduced social connection, increased mortality, reduced student performance, a lower air quality, and particularly when we, we're talking about ground level ozone formation, it can further exacerbate existing social inequities. And that is in part because every single urban system that's negatively affected by heat, the burden of that is borne disproportionately by. Uh, the most vulnerable uh, and, and least resourced uh, people in, in our communities. The third category is stress on natural systems. Hot urban services can increase the temperature of stormwater that, ru that runs off and thus of urban water waste uh, to temperatures that are uh, dangerous for aquatic flora and fauna. Rising temperatures stress native uh, species that are adapted to cooler climates. And we see also increased disease vectors uh, that uh, native flora may not have experienced. Uh, in the past, and this increases the, ch the challenge of a city's response to climate change. Many times we see uh, cities attempting to uh, grow their way out of or, or uh, plant trees and, and uh, other uh, green infrastructure, and they're running into challenges with uh, rising heat, making that even more difficult to keep those, uh, that, those assets uh, in place. And, and finally, I'd say that there's a stress on, ec on economic resilience in, in, in our urban areas that's brought on by heat. High temperatures reduce factory productivity, increase the energy costs, curtail and restrict outdoor labor, and reduce tourism. And further, responding to all the other stresses that I've just mentioned takes a huge financial toll on municipal and private sector budgets, on, uh, uh, on credit risk profiles, and other very important sort of financial aspects of, of running a city. Uh, now, if we take that a little further and just distill these different effects down to their economic impacts, uh, I'd like just to just talk about this study. And we weren't a part of this study here, but this Estrada et al. from 2017 was a study of 1,692 cities uh, from around the world of various sizes. And, and they, they find that the effect of excess urban heat, if left unchecked, will reduce the annual economic output of the median city in their study by 1.7% by 2050, 
five point six percent by twenty one hundred, and in the worst case, in the worst affected cities, up to eleven percent of their annual GDP, their annual economic output, would be uh, would be uh, impacted uh, by a lack of act, by a lack of action on on rising temperatures. So you can think of this as a massive tax on heat in action. And to put that in context, today, uh, even our most impacted cities are spending a fraction of 1% of their GDP on these issues. So we're going to see a pretty tremendous increase in the economic effect of heat if we're, if we're not uh, taking action today. So the urgency of action is clear uh, when it relates to heat, uh, but the most commonly discussed solution, which is, happens to be more active uh, air conditioning, more efficient air conditioning, uh, presents a number of challenges when it relates to urban heat. Uh, we see, we're see we seeing massive increases in air conditioning unit demand and cooling energy demand worldwide, and enough that it will require the construction of new electric generation that's equivalent to the existing capacity of the US, Europe, and India combined uh, to meet it. And even if we invested the trillions and trillions of US dollars that it would take uh, to, 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 to build out that, in, that infrastructure, it would take years to construct and the demand that we're seeing from air conditioning is here now. So the stress on the system will be happening now, regardless of whether we choose to build the capacity to meet it. And in addition, air conditioning technology, at least as it exists today, vapor compression uh, technology, exhausts heat into the, into the outside air and raises air temperatures. Now this extends the gap between cooling haves and cooling have-nots. For approximately a billion people worldwide, active space cooling measures are either not physically or not economically accessible. And so for both sides of the cooling crisis, passive cooling measures offer a critical path forward. For those with air conditioning, passive cooling measures reduce energy use and ease the strain on the electric grid in budgets. And for those without air conditioning, uh, passive cooling provides critical thermal comfort benefits that will be needed to survive and thrive in a warming world. And because rising temperatures have a negative effect across so many urban and human systems, passive cooling measures that reduce temperatures or improve resilience to heat have equally broad benefits. And viewing through the lens of the Sustainable Development Goals, we see that an effort to build resilience to heat and to mitigate heat through passive cooling can actually help achieve 11 of the 17 goals uh, of the SDG, uh, with a particular focus on SDG 3, 11, 10, and 13. So I've been mentioning passive cooling measures, but what, what exactly do we mean by that? Well, there are a wide variety of options uh, that, are, that passively cool through a, a wide variety of mechanisms. Uh, the first I'll talk about here is reflective surfaces. Here we can increase the ability of urban roofs, walls, and pavements to reflect rather than to absorb solar radiation. And this is most commonly achieved by lightening their color. Uh, you often hear about white roofs or cool roofs in, in this category. We can also increase the amount of vegetated cover and tree canopy to help create shade, particularly when those trees uh, are placed in a strategic way around the buildings and to cool through uh, uh, the, the evapotranspiration process. Uh, we can increase the number and accessibility to natural and man-made water features. We're actually seeing right now on a project in Guangzhou, China, where a redevelopment of a downtown historic uh, portion of the city is being built around uh, new water features uh, that will be upwind from the downtown core and actually cool through uh, through the, the process of, of you know, the wind blowing over the water. Uh, you can incorporate passive cooling designs into buildings, such as increased thermal uh, insulation and other uh, building energy efficiency measures. These can uh, both improve the thermal comfort of the building and reduce the need for air conditioning, which of course gets you to minimizing the waste heat that we generate in our cities. Uh, this is both, again through uh, building energy efficiency measures but also through shifting to higher capacity public transportation or to electric vehicles. And then finally, designing our urban spaces to minimize uh, heat buildup and retention and to maximize the natural wind flows that move through urban areas. So thinking a little bit beyond the building and more to the community scale. Now, the primer that I mentioned goes into a great deal of detail about the various trade-offs and, and applicability, but I'd say in general, uh, passive urban cooling solutions are applicable in nearly every climate. Uh, highly solar reflective roofs and walls are most effective in warmer climates, but they can deliver net energy savings in cold climates as well. Uh, green roofs and walls are broadly applicable across climates, uh, though they perform best where there is adequate access to water, especially in the, in the early stages of their uh, development. Uh, and they also require buildings with sufficient structural support to bear their weight. 
Uh, solar reflective pavements can reduce air temperatures, but need to be carefully cited uh, when applying in dense urban areas such as urban canyons. And permeable pavements are best deployed uh, where there are where, where both stormwater management and urban cooling are desired. Uh, and tree canopy, we see tree canopy as a, as a uh, highly desirable option from for many places, not only because of the heat uh, mitigation benefits, but also the wide variety of ecosystem services they provide. Uh, but they obviously would need to be cited in a way that doesn't interfere with existing utilities or road infrastructure. And selecting native species that will also thrive as local climates uh, change is going to be an important uh, uh, characteristic. Now, other passive solutions such as reducing waste heat, uh, heat sensitive urban planning, and improving energy efficiency are beneficial on all buildings and in all climates. Uh, if we look at what are the opportunities here for actually reducing temperatures, well, a comprehensive review of studies evaluated the, that have evaluated the effectiveness of these urban cooling strategies find that when deployed at a city scale, they would meaningfully reduce outdoor urban air temperatures up to five degrees Celsius in some cases. Each solution's effect will vary, of course, based on buildings, uh, building characteristics, and their age, the urban environment, uh, land cover, meteorological and, and geographical conditions. And these effects will also phase in on their variety of time scales. Uh, some solutions provide immediate cooling. For example, uh, the installation of a cool roof will provide uh, a cooling benefit to the building and to the, the, the near surface air temperatures uh, the minute it's applied. Uh, other solutions, particularly natural options like trees, may take years to provide their cooling benefits as the trees, for example, mature. Uh, so we recommend a combination of solutions that might be, uh, that, or rather a combination of solutions uh, that might be highly effective in a temperate humid climate, like where I live in Washington, DC, may have little to no positive effect in a desert climate, such as Dubai. So it's very important to take these into account when we're thinking about what the combination uh, 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 that we deploy will be. But these are the basic building blocks around a, a passive cooling strategy. Now, all that said, the research finds that, you know, average outdoor air temperatures can be reduced by about uh, a third of a degree Celsius for every uh, 0.1 increase in reflectivity. And that's equivalent, imagining, if you imagine a, uh, uh, the difference between a, uh, a brand new concrete sidewalk and one that has aged for a year or so. Uh, that's the difference, that's about a 0.1 difference. So it's not a tremendous difference in, temp in, in color to get that benefit. Uh, the deployment of green roofs at a city scale uh, can reduce air temperatures by up to three degrees Celsius. Uh, similarly with tree deployment, uh, up to three degrees Celsius uh, with the greatest cooling benefits really uh, within 30 meters of the tree. We know that waste heat from active mechanical cooling uh, particularly from the vapor compression technologies that that, uh, that dominate today, can add between one degree and two degrees uh, uh, to nighttime air temperatures in cities where uh, that technology is is common. And so, efforts to improve the efficiency and to reduce the need to operate mechanical cooling equipment can have a direct impact on urban air temperatures. And of course, urban design choices that maximize natural wind flows and minimize trapped heat can help cities stay cooler, as I mentioned. As an example, an increase in wind speed of 1.5 meters per second was determined to reduce air temperatures in Singapore by two degrees Celsius. So these are pretty substantial uh, opportunities when uh, thought of individually and then when they're combined. Uh, th these are, these are uh, you know, cooling opportunities that uh, will substantially improve uh, human health and resilience of our urban systems. So just returning to the Estrada 2017, 2017 paper, when we consider these benefits uh, from an economic perspective, uh, that paper also evaluated uh, this a set of integrated approaches that they mostly focused on cooling green roofs and cool pavements. And they found that, th that those investments in those technologies can return anywhere between $1.50 uh, and $15 for every dollar invested. So, and that depends on the mix of solutions and the aggressiveness of the deployment scenario. But a pretty substantial uh, economic benefit uh, uh, can accrue from, from investing in these technologies as well. So I've talked about these in, uh, passive cooling measures kind of in an individual basis, but I think it's really critical that we think, uh, similar to what uh, Professor Anumba was mentioning, that we think about these as a system of systems and as a, in an integrated approach. Uh, the urban cooling mitigation potential uh, from the combined use of variety of approaches is actually often greater than the sum of the contributions of each individual solution. There are real symbioses between these. And some examples of the enhanced benefits of a combined deployment strategy include you can, have, you can see solar output from solar uh, photovoltaic panels 
increased when placed over a green roof versus over a black roof, which tends to be a hotter surface. So there's more, uh, more efficiency in the, not only in the panel itself, but also in the transfer of that uh, electricity into the system. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, shaded ref solar reflective pavements providing a maximum benefit to uh, pedestrian thermal comfort when, uh, when, when, they're, when they're deployed together. Uh, and obviously urban design and planning that prioritizes heat mitigation that will help optimize building and community scale cooling strategies, such as green space and solar reflective surfaces. Now an integrated heat strategy also beyond just integrating the passive cooling measures also means considering multiple hazards when planning these. So for example, passive cooling measures that can also uh, improve stormwater management uh, would make sense to prioritize in areas where both heat and flooding are a challenge. And now this may sound self-evident, but in, in fact, many cities still do not plan this way. So really thinking about the holistic challenges a city faces and how uh, a focus on passive cooling can help meet both the challenge of heat, but also some of the other uh, uh, resilience challenges cities face is gonna be critical. Now, despite the clear benefits uh, that we see to the passive cooling, uh, they have been slow to deploy both in the United States and globally. And that is because efforts to implement technical urban passive cooling solutions face several unique challenges. And the first one is there is no one really in a city or at any level of governance that owns the problem of heat. The responsibility for implementing and, and, and supportive policies is diffused across a variety of municipal departments and, and organizations. You can think the mayor's office, uh, Department of Public Works and Transportation, Parks, the Departments of Health and so on. All of these different actors, not to mention community organizations and other, uh, other organizations, uh, all need to be at the table and all have a, a part to play, but no one owns the entire problem. So that becomes, makes it a challenge to uh, coordinate an effective solution. There's still a lack of awareness and availability of passive cooling solutions. This is especially true in the developing world. Uh, there's still a lack of awareness of, of the cooling benefits, and importantly, what the what the benefits are in a local context. We still haven't done enough to demonstrate how these technologies alone and together will actually benefit at, at a, at, in a local context in the places that need them the most. And outside of a few examples, uh, namely Paris and, and New York and a few other cities, uh, there really isn't a, a comprehensive and integrated set of policy solutions for urban cooling at the city level. We see lots of uh, one-off policy, uh, or maybe a program for cool roofs or a program for uh, uh, more green space, but rarely do we see them integrated together in, in a really functional way. Uh, roofs may be used as living and storage space, which makes it more challenging to use them for uh, improving building thermal comfort, uh, or it limits the, 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 the cooling measures that you can use. Uh, in many cases, we find that buildings may not be adequately constructed or maintained to support some passive cooling solutions. So the applicability isn't just in the climate, it's also in the built-in environment and the, uh, and the, the characteristics that, that, that you're facing. And then of course, the problem that we all face with all of these challenges is just a lack of financing at all levels for cities and building owners to implement these solutions. Uh, there's a great study that came out from a, a foundation called Climate Works that found that globally, only 2% of uh, global philanthropic giving is going to, the, to climate change, which when you consider where heat sits within climate change, it's a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So even in philanthropic giving, uh, we're not seeing anywhere near the focus that we need to see on, uh, on the challenge of heat. And when we consider the potential impacts that unchecked heat can have on urban economies, on urban credit risk, and so on, uh, it, it really shows that there needs to be a much more institutional focus on, on financing in, in this space. So to wrap up, I, I wanna share an initiative that we're working on to address uh, some of these barriers. Uh, and this is the Million Cool Roofs Challenge. Uh, it's an effort to support the implementation of passive cooling in new markets where such measures would be particularly beneficial. As you can see the 10 countries we're working in uh, here on the map on the right, uh, highlighted in green. And our premise was that the most potent and persistent way uh, to overcome the barriers uh, that exist to uh, passive cooling, both in a general sense, but also in the specifics of the local context, would be to identify and support local champions and to connect those champions to their peers and global experts. So the challenge selected and funded 10 teams uh, to compete for a million dollar prize for installing cool roofs and catalyzing policy and market awareness that can lead to a million square meters of new high quality cool roofs. 
And there's nothing magical about the number 1 million square meters, but we wanted to uh, set a goal that we felt would be transformative and demonstrate that uh, the approach taken by those teams uh, was scalable and, and successful. Now the teams are led by a variety of different types of organizations. We have some that are universities, some uh, NGOs, uh, some are actual government agencies. So it really runs the gamut in terms of who's uh, leading these challenges. We even have uh, private companies in some cases uh, uh, leading their teams. Uh, and they've taken a wide variety of approaches uh, to, to, uh, to, to reach the goal. Most have done uh, demonstration projects to build out their local understanding and to, and to create an, an opportunity to, to see uh, passive cooling and, and cool roofs in action. And while COVID has slowed the teams down, the pandemic has slowed the teams down, uh, most are now back in action and will be wrapping up uh, by the summer of 2021. And as uh, uh, Professor Didi mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, UPI and Professor Paramita uh, leading a team as part of this Million Cool Roofs Challenge uh, and, 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 and helping to bring uh, and expand cool roofs in, in Indonesia. And, and I'd say her work is a great example of the potential we are hoping to realize with this challenge uh, in all of the countries we're working in. Her team has undertaken demonstrations on a variety of government, industrial, and residential structures, and they've gathered important performance data, including some really uh, startling numbers on how just how much cooler the inside of buildings can be when once a cool roof is installed. Uh, it, her team has partnered with a U.S. coatings uh, roof coatings manufacturer, and they've established local manufacturing capacity, which reduces the costs, but most importantly creates local jobs. So not just uh, bringing something in uh, from outside, but really trying to create and build up an industry and, a, and an opportunity uh, locally that will be, we, in our minds, a, a much more sustainable approach going forward. Now, these efforts have started to attract attention from policymakers at all levels, including with our UN partners. And so this is exactly the kind of catalyst we were hoping to see when designing the challenge. And so we're excited to see how the barriers uh, how, how barriers are overcome uh, by champions like uh, Professor Paramita and her and her colleagues in, in the challenge. So I will leave it there and thank you kindly for your time today. And I look forward to your questions uh, later in the in the uh, in, in the plenary. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurt Schickman, for your elaborative and informative presentation per pertinent to passive cooling strategies. You elaborated how you and your institution has conducted uh, developing alliance among stakeholders across the world and how you contribute to cooling this planet. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our fellow conference participants. Now we move forward to our third keynote speaker, Professor Muhammad Shaum Barliana. I believe he's already joining us in this uh, occasion. He is currently the Dean of Faculty of Technology and Vocational okay. Education, Education, Universitas Education. Indonesia. 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 He earned his he Doctor earned of his Social Science Education degree from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia in 2008. His field of expertise is in the field of architectural design, history and theory of architecture, sociology of architecture, and technical and vocational education. Among his uh, relevant publications to this CENFAR 20 conference are Building Performance, Development of Environmental Education Program to Create Sustainable Buildings, Evaluation of Environmental Literacy of Vocational High School Students, and Environmental Consciousness of the Low Income Community. In this very occasion, Professor Barliana will be sharing with us his expertise relevant to our conference. The presentation title is Urban Retrofitting from Dead Space to community space. Professor Berliana, I would like to kindly remind that the speech should be delivered in 30 minutes and we will have a question and answer afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, please devote our full attention to listen to Professor Berliana's presentation. Professor Berliana, this opportunity is yours. Thank you, Bu Ilham Dania, as moderator, and thank you, 
or Bubeta as organizing committee. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have all of you watching my presentation from your face is a good health. Alhamdulillah. Today I will deliver my topic, title Urban Retrofitting from Dead Space to Community Space. You heard me? Who is that? Yes, Professor Barliana. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah. My presentation is uh, simple, which consists of background explanation, literal review, and empirical case studies. First, for the background, I will start the phenomenon that the due to birth and urbanization as population levels, economic development and capitalistic industrial, complexity urban management, externally isolated technology and disruptions, modernism and lifestyle hedonism, and property of urban community have created chronic urban problems. And actual and urban design that is improper with inadequate urban planning policy resulted in a degradation, the degradation of the city quality levels with environment disparity and unbalanced varied urban growth. So this space is a residue architectural, the residue uh, architectural part of the urban disparity and unbalanced space problem. This space pay more attention to the city micro physical condition is the disappearance of agricultural space which has an uh, impact on the degradation of social interaction and values of society. Uh, so this space depends tend to emerge from the gap between what was envisioned and visioned for a building before constructed and what was deemed necessary for the building was being used. We might find that there is much dead space within architecture that has been softly conceived. This space are the result of poor planning. The floor planners or architect create buildings that do not flow within the existing wood environment, creating focus of space devoid of human occupancy. Conversely, the space can be planned and thought out, yet not as successful as initially intended. In this case, space can be highly occupied, yet devoid of any social interactions. That's uh, referring to the background and the theory shown that the three categories about this space. Throughout the urban environment, there are facet of space that deter opportunity of social interaction. To further clarify the definition, this space is a space within the built environment devoid of social interaction between people. This space can be further defined by breaking it down, down into three terms or category. Following the Kraval Hall, consisting of urban cracks, non fast space, and interstitial space. Urban crack is a term introduced by Dickyoff, conceptualist as in between time space in which different logics meet and conflicts. They describe the various void within the city that become scarce within the urban landscape. These cracks are caused by urban decay, mis misuse of space, for planning and gives the space a feeling that is unsanitary and unsafe. These urban cracks are another ones of the ways that the term this space is defined. This space regularly awaits a future des destination within the context of urban renewal. To combat this urban cracks, architects can create an interpretation that inform people of this space cause in hopes that the lesson can be learned and these cracks will not rise again. 
the urban environment, there are pockets of space that deter the opportunity of social inter interactions. One more category that did that deals with this space that are populated, which are called non place While they are still populated and frequented space, barely any social interaction occurs within non place thus rendering them dead space. As mentioned earlier in this paper, the space are space devoid of social interaction. Social interaction is what determines a space. It is what gives meaning to place. The problem of non-place, which produce an expression of loneliness, reducing, reducing social inter, interaction in public space to a few scenarios, could be used as a starting point for examining emerging alternative form of society in public space. By not having social interaction, space continues down a cyclical path of becoming non-place. As mentioned above, non-place evolves feelings of loneliness with, within a space, which discourages occupants from interacting, and the lack of interaction continues to feel to feed into the idea of loneliness. To break this trend of non-place, action must be taken to disrupt the spiraling trend. Reinterpretation of the existing routine scenarios, proposing alternative ones, which draw attention to the potential of particular place, reorganizing of the space structure of public space by installing new objects. We start attacking pressure by unprovoked and active interpretation of it. Third, uh, inter interstitial space are in between space within the urban fabric. We serve both official and uh, unofficial full force. The in between of society often climb such space. The people climb intersection, vacant walls, and building sites as their territory. Most interstitial space become this urban youth meeting, conversation, and enter entertainment sites. This space come about through the city improper planning, creating negative space within the built environment. Interstitial space offer a lot more potential in terms of space functionally than originally intended. As a result, people often take informal ownership of this space and redefine the space functions. Discussing give recognition to the in-between space and offer a technical form that can be reinterpreted reinterpreted and implemented throughout the city. By understanding the spatial quality of the voids and the non-void, we can reinterpret the void throughout the city. Also, by understanding the city structure and how it operates, we can create a to the transformation of the city. Next is analyzed based on empirical studies. Based, based on the analysis of the issue of the space above, many, many cities require retro, retrofitting. Four case studies of urban retrofitting are presented in the following with three different perspectives, experimental, conceptual, and real or factual case. Experimental case related to urban crack retrofitting. The conceptual case talk about the retrofitting part of a city that is starting on by space. And last, the factual case refer to the implementation of retrofitting and the real experience of revitalizing 
interstitial space in urban street and housing area. Experimental case study uh, about the uh, urban crack retrofitting case. We know economic development and trading transition models in the future for urban design and lifestyle change will soon lead to alcohol and urban decay. Urban decay will cause the space which is urban cracks typhus. Urban crack, the abandoned space, and the building will soon become a frame of the city. The development of tremendous information. The development of tremendous information technology towards digital media and visual will change the lifestyle of the citizen, including in the, in the transaction of consumptive goods. Consumptive goods. The COVID-19 pandemic presents accelerated the lifestyle change even in Indonesia was digital literacy is still low level. The online shopping behavior will soon replace a large shopping mall function, which will then be abandoned space, a place of residue city. There will be there, there will be a significant amount of building with redundant gray and dusty space. Is the dead space is present. The development of information and communication technology has an impact of, on various on various kinds of convenience in lifestyles. Various needs can be met by playing with gadget without moving or being in direct contact with the outside environment. In the long run, this results in a loss of social interaction and human will be alienated. In broader sense, the human world enter the era of cyberspace, cyberspace, a model of life with a virtual reality. However, humans are naturally created with a physical reality that is always growing and directly contacting other humans. Therefore, in the long term, cyberspace will probably probably create philosophical emptiness, emptiness ideological vacuum and ethical vacuum. Society will be in a variety of saturation and then longing so that at one time human have the desire to interact without having to make, to make transaction. On the other hand, there are many abandoned architecture and infrastructure due to, to the loss of visitor. It is crucial to create a solution of design to revitalize this space and negative gray space replaced by communal space that has social education and recreation. The second case study concerned the retrofitting in non-pest non space. A space that provide a buffer between McDonald's stores and Western Avenue on Lincoln F. F. Chicago. That area is a plaza which no one takes advantage of except, of except for inbound and outbound traffic of McDonald's drive through. And the first case, as aldermen and city leaders took the initiative to retrofit the area to the Make Way for People project. Retrofitting design involves citizen participation through survey to capture citizen aspiration regarding the types of function, activities, and access element most desirable to activate the public space area. There were recorded more 2,200 comments from 1,200 people in just 12 days. Some respondents said they wanted to see lounge seating, food truck parking, garden lights, sunset, mural as an aesthetic element, experimental lighting, 
and film movie screenings. The plaza is also expected to be used throughout the seasons, including when temperature drop during fall and winter. The third case study is taken from the reality of retrofitting this space under the Pasupati Fly Rover. It's Jalan Kebumbit, Bandung Wetan. The squatter, the squatter as this space revitalized and retrofit, retrofit become a film park at the initiative of Riwan Kamil as the major of Bandung at the time. In addition to accommodating free movie watching activities, this park is also a place to play for children and teenagers, including surfing the internet because it is equipped with Wi-Fi. The film park was designed by the show architectural consultants with the concept of open free space, which has the area of 1,300 square meter complete with an um, amphitheater with capacity of 500 people. The seats, the seats are placed on the ground, analogous, analogous to the contours of the hills of Bandung, or terrace, or terrace of rice field or wavy water. The film park is designed like a green terrace with synthetic grass. This place is also equipped with giant billboard video technology. The decoration around the garden are decorated by colorful neon lights. The bottom of the amphitheater is also decorated with porcelain, so it looks pretty at the night. The latest study is based on a real and factual case, based on the experience of architect Rosanna Monteo in designing and implementing retrofitting a residential area in San Pablo, South Mexico City. For more than 15 years, the resident family apartment at San Pablo, South like Cesar Solano and his wife, did not let their three children go outside to play. When he left his small apartment this morning to walk at the tire factory, he would hustle through the pens and get dividing the overgrown courtyards, avoiding the southern corner occupied by cluster of young men with pests and body tattoos and dogs. A few, a few years after they bought the apartment with agreement loans, the public space outside this door became forbidding by day and terrifying by night when the local drug trade closed. Residents with more pens and gates and cover their window with iron, making the space even less welcoming. It was a frightening place nobody came to visit. Four years ago, something changed, something changed. A woman architect, Rosanna Monteo, and team arrived and spent several days asking the residents surprisingly intimate questions about how they would prefer to spend, day, spend their days and nights. Several weeks that was forward by persuading people to tear down that pen, their fence, and then a couple of months overseeing the clearing, building and painting of new structure and space. The gates and saddles space are gone and with them the sketchy goes. The architect will build sunny, functional space between the three where residents wanted to spend time together. There is an open air library where kids hang out and child care takes place. A resident run gym, hole in the walls 
those where people sell typos, a place to dance at the night. Two years after it was built, it looked fresher than ever and full of people. Resident voluntary keep it sweat and secure, spending their night gathering and taking rather than adding insights. The people who own the apartment have discovered that, that their property values and they ran their can colleagues have risen for the first time since the early 90s. The termination of San Pablo Salpa was the work of Rosana Montail was all female architecture practice has recently attracted international acclaim for is intimate, low cost side action. Montaigne's intervention are one successful effort to confront what might be the century's most challenging and underappreciated urban problem. The empty, the empty space between buildings. The majority of the wall city dweller now live, now live in high rise dwelling. And in many Western countries, immigration and properly have become concentrated in suburban, suburban apartment district. As a result, this, those, this space have become a lot more than in communication, in convenience for residents. Montel called the projects common unidades which really translate to common unity. It was, she said, not so much a matter of building something as removing impediments standing in the way of the community desire to come together. They solved a lot of small things in order to change a lot. Okay, that's all my paper presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Have a good day. Thank you, Ibu Ilham. Thank you very much, Professor Barliana, for your informative presentation pertinent to urban retrofitting. You have mentioned about how to retrofit urban space with the different approaches, uh, such as experimental, conceptual, and also factual approach. It is very relevant to the context of our conference today. Thank you very much all keynote speakers uh, who have delivered their speeches. Now uh, we move forward to the question and answer session. Uh, participants are welcome to ask questions by typing your question in the chat box and indicating to whom the question is addressed. Uh, I will read the, the question and kindly ask the designated speaker to respond to the question. I would like to ask for the help from the host to uh, provide me with the question to be answered by our keynote speakers. Thank you. We have our first question. It is from Muhammad Nur Fajri Al Fata, and this question is addressed to Professor Anumba. Due to global warming and climate change, fire risk increasing, as well as the fire incident, including recently that occurred in the US, California, probably. It is predicted that the warming will keep increasing in the future. So when the global warming effects is inevitable, do you think we still can bounce back into the previous condition? Professor Anumba. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I think that uh, what you're looking at is uh, in terms of bouncing back is to what extent can you restore uh, the previous condition or better? Uh, by um, taking appropriate measures to one, mitigate the potential mm -hmm. impact, uh, and then secondly, to make sure that when you have rebuilt, uh, that another fire doesn't come and reduce things back to where they were. And so that is really the 
question that has to be asked. What exactly do we need to do uh, in order to ensure that these disasters do not continue to repeat uh, on a regular scale? Uh, so there are the global issues we need to do to tackle climate change. Uh, and that will hopefully uh, result in uh, fewer incidents uh, of these sorts of natural hazards. Uh, but then at a local level, we need to look at, okay, what are the specifics of the local environment uh, that we need to plan better uh, and we need to design better in order to mitigate the potential for for fires. And the same applies to hurricanes and flooding and, and all of these other sorts of disasters. Uh, for example, in Puerto Rico, uh, just looking at the way the houses have been built and, um, and simply going back to rebuild in exactly the same way, uh, it's not going to help. It just means that the next hurricane will come back and, and knock everything back down. So you really need to think about how do we harden the built environment in such a way that, um, that you're kind of building back better and having strong, uh, stronger resilience uh, built into the systems. And that also, as I said before, uh, needs to take account of uh, all of the interconnected systems. Because uh, if you do not take everything into account, uh, it means that you solve one problem uh, and then you have other um, inappropriate consequences elsewhere. Thank you very much, Professor Anumba. Uh, I hope that answer the question raised by Muhammad Nurfadri al Fatah. Uh, now we move forward to the second question. I believe that this second question is raised to Mr. Kurt Schickman. It is from Yaseri Aprita Sari. The question is, regarding passive cooling integrated in the cities, what is the effective strategy for high density cities, of vertical city and horizontal city? Is there any different strategy addressing the two typology? Mr. Shikman, please. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it depends on how they're growing vertically and how they're growing horizontally. If we see the way cities are currently growing and especially in rapidly uh, urbanizing, developing country contexts, the horizontal uh, growth is happening in an unplanned way, which I think has led to uh, substantial increases in the type and in heat and in the challenges of heat vulnerability. Uh, in terms of the effective uh, sort of passive cooling measures, they're, they're fairly similar. Uh, I think the difference is not so much in the measure, but how it's applied. So as an example here, uh, green space in most contexts is a, is a good passive cooling measure to include in the sort of suite of, of measures that you're looking at. Uh, but you may not be able to have a large scale you know, public park like you might have, say, in, like in New York or Paris. But then you look at a city like Seoul, South Korea, where they have invested in, rather than large contiguous park spaces, they're looking at opportunities to uh, build uh, mini parks or parklets. And they've done, I think about 13 or 1400 of these within the city limits. So it's, it's I think a, a, a more strategic use of the space that exists, particularly in cities that are dense, uh, that, that we see here, rather than a difference in the types of measures they're taking. The one, the one uh, exception to that, I guess I would bring up just off the top of my head would be uh, uh, at least the, the physical ability to use district cooling opportunities where you, you have you know, a central plant for cooling of multiple sets of buildings offers opportunities to reduce the, the point source, you know, heat, uh, the uh, waste heat. Obviously there are some economic considerations there. There's, those are expensive systems. But from a physical perspective, the density of the city will make that an easier uh, or, or a higher impact investment. So there are some opportunities that accrue with passive cooling that come from 
uh, you know, when cities are denser that are maybe only in denser cities that you, you would see those sorts of uh, interventions. Thank you very much, Mr. Shikma, for the answer and elaborate answer to the question raised. Um, now we'd like to move forward to our third question. The question is raised from Sandra. Uh, it is addressed to Professor Barliana. Her question is, what, if, what is the effective approach of the, or effective method for retrofitting the dead space? Professor Barliana. Thank you, Willa. I'd like to say uh, thank you for the Sandra. And I think uh, retrofitting this space is not just not a technology or physical, but uh, of course is a social approach. So I, for example, the uh, Montail uh, said is he comes to the site is not the the first is not the technology or physical architectural, but is approach the social uh, people, and uh, he spend their days and the night and uh, he uh, see question. For example, where did you have uh, your first kiss? Where would your kids play hit and six? This, for example, is a, a social approach. And I think uh, the second uh, effective mode to strengthen the capital social of community. Then people feels that the space and belongs to them. So it's architect architecture is not a, a panacea solution, but it's a social approach is important. Secondly, to strengthen it, of course, community should engage in the process of design. Participation is important. Development and until maintenance of this, the space for secure uh, implemented uh, design. And uh, lastly, the design itself should stand on wider community level needs. I think uh, maybe my uh, answer. Thank you, Wilhelm. Thank you very much, Professor Berliana. Thank you very much, Sandra, for addressing the question. Uh, now we move forward to another question raised from Ibu Beta Paramita, Professor Paramita. And this question is raised to Professor Anumba. I believe that the resilient city based on the preparation, but somehow in the third country like us, resilient becomes something happens by accident. So perhaps you have an experience to enhance the resilient effort related to vulnerable community, which has no access to any resources. Professor Anumba. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's a bit of a difficult question because uh, without any resources, it's difficult to do anything. Uh, but I think what I will say is that um, there are a number of solutions and approaches that do not involve um, a lot of expenses. Uh, because if you think about it, we had a lot of um, low cost solutions that do not rely on um, a lot of what I would call heavy engineering. Uh, for example, the presentation by um, uh, Shikman talked more about passive cooling without too much um, uh, use of uh, mechanical ventilation. That has, been, that has worked in a lot of places. So when you start talking about resilience in, in many areas, there are things you can do simply with planting, for example, uh, which is probably not as expensive as uh, building all sorts of um, um, walls and other solutions. So there are, at the key, there are all sorts of strategies 
out there, but the key is to work with the with the local community and have a range of um, solutions for various scenarios. Because uh, these things are not implemented in a vacuum. Uh, so you have models that uh, paint the picture in terms of what will happen over the next um, two, three years, five years, 10 years. And they have a, a series of adaptation strategies that will help you to, um, to deal with those scenarios. And, and then in relationship with those um, uh, adaptation strategies, you also have the reality of what are the resources that are available uh, to actually implement those. And so it's a case of working with the, with the local communities to figure out what are the most cost-effective solutions for the resources available. Thank you, Professor Anumba, for the response to Professor Paramita's uh, question. Uh, now we move forward to our next question. The next question is addressed to Mr. Shikhan. Uh, it is from Kunti Herma Dwidayati. So what is the most challenging aspect of promoting the Cool Roof Program and how you and your institution have overcome that? That's a tough question because I, uh, given the, the year um, that we've had with the pandemic, it is sometimes hard to uh, separate what is a pandemic challenge from what is a challenge of establishing a new concept in a new place. I guess I would say that in general, it has been uh, ensuring the availability of viable but economically sustainable uh, products, especially when there isn't a market yet to sustain it. So we're talking about, in many cases, not so much the case in Indonesia, but in some of the other places we're working, this will be the first time these products have been available. So there's a large education process, not just with the, the market, but with customs officials. In many of the countries where the, these products are, are, at first they're being brought in, they're being imported, uh, they're facing you know, between 50 and 60% tariffs. So you can quickly eat through a budget uh, to, uh, to get yourself established just simply on uh, customs duties. So what we've tried to do is um, work with our teams and uh, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, acquire, you know, uh, um, uh, tariff waivers or temporary tariff waivers to, to, to get around that. And then more generally try to link the teams that are on the ground working with the broader uh, sort of international efforts to uh, build heat resilience. And I think in that way, it's, it's helped to take this away from a specific local market uh, and try to and put it in the bigger context of the global movement towards uh, passive cooling and towards uh, heat resilience. And, and I think that has helped, but I don't want to give the impression that we've solved all the challenges. I think part of the Million Cool Roofs challenge has been uh, these teams were entering into a, um, there weren't, they weren't answers yet and the teams are discovering those answers. Uh, and so I think it, what, we're, what we're uncovering here is there are uh, ways that have worked. There are challenges we didn't anticipate. And it really comes down to supporting the local teams as best we can with the specific challenges they have. And at the end of this, what we're hoping we'll see is a set of either business cases or roadmaps that we can then uh, scale elsewhere. So I, I don't think we have the, all the answers yet, but these teams are doing uh, pretty amazing work to help us uncover what those are. Thank you, Mr. Shikman, for like sharing your experience and challenges you have faced. And although those challenges are not like all of them are addressed, but at least you and your institution have made uh, efforts to tackle those issues. Um, we move forward to the next question. Uh, the next question is from Randy Perdana Hitman. Uh, he is uh, our uh, alumni, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, and is currently 
pursuing his PhD degree in University of Kitakyushu, Japan. So his question to Professor Bardiana is regarding to the decaying buildings, do you have any insight how to fund the demolition of those buildings? Because in many cases, the owners of the buildings and the management usually do not care or simply do not have money to do so. Professor Baliana. Thank you, Randy. First thing is about the uh, management economical <laughs> building, yeah. But okay, uh, I think it's uh, government and people are still taking care of the city problem, including this space case. This space case, I think, is caused one of cause by this space is a uh, decreasing economy. So the people is not is not come to the site. So it's economical is died. So I think uh, to apa, to retrofitting the fund of uh, building decay, I think is uh, effort to how to come the people to the the city. Maybe is uh, to revitalize the apa, the uh, tourism or economical. Uh, the other and, and extra. I, I think so is, uh, or maybe it's uh, like uh, Rivan Kamil is, is called the uh, CSR, Company Social Responsibility. I think it's one to uh, the fun of uh, uh, retrofitting the dead space. Or I think it's cooperation with investor, maybe. Thank you, Randy. We have. Thank you, very much. Ya, jawabannya, Bu. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Barliana. Uh, thank you very much, Randy, for addressing the question to Professor Barliana. Um, we can move forward to another question. And uh, also, this question is raised from Randy uh, to Professor Anumba. So, based on your activities in Shadra Key, what was the adaptation strategy proposed and how did the citizen respond to it? Was the proposal directed more to the infrastructure or citizen's behavior toward the phenomena? Perhaps we can learn from your experience, remembering that we are here in Indonesia, have also severe experience about a disaster. Uh, one of those are flooding. So Professor Anumba. Thank you very much. Um, the um, initial study was uh, fo focused on um, trying to identify exactly what the potential impact would be. Um, and so discussions are ongoing as to what should the adaptation strategy be, uh, because all, um, what we just did was to expose what the what the potential problem would be. And then beyond that, it's up to the municipal authorities to then um, commission um, work to establish uh, what are the, what they would like to do. And that again, depends on resources. Um, but the sort of typical adaptation strategies you would have in these sorts of um, coastal communities would involve um, moving further away from the coast, uh, building some uh, sea walls. Um, in the case of Sidaki, uh, being uh, a little bit further out into the, into the ocean, uh, into the Gulf, um, some of those may not be appropriate. Uh, so that, that's a, range of possibilities that, that we did not get into that um, with that particular study. Thank you very much, Professor Anumba, for sharing the experience in Sederki. Um, now we move forward to the question from uh, Dr. Donny Kurniawan. He's from ITB, a lecturer from Bandung Institute of Technology. And his question is addressed to Mr. Shikman. Instead of cool roof, is there any opportunity to make urban cooler 
with the cool pavement, which is better based on your experience on research? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess I would start by saying, I don't see this as an either or, these are two different urban surfaces. And so I think you can do both. But with the question, I think there are key differences when we talk about this, it's a similar cooling mechanism, the reflectivity, solar reflectivity, but they, they're very different considerations to, to think about there. But the first is with, with roofs for the most part, the roof doesn't interact with other people or with other buildings for the most part, certainly compared to what you see with the pavement. The interactions between pavements and buildings and pavements and pedestrians is very complicated very and very complex. Uh, and so there is a real, where you can make more blanket statements about where to do a cool roof. I think you there is a, a need to be more careful when, when we're talking about cool pavement, just in terms of, so we're not uh, in, uh, exacerbating any particular challenges. Now that said, the the use of pavement, even in a condition where you, let's say you have a building very close to the pavement with a you know large uh, wall to or window to wall ratio, you may increase the temperature in that building because the reflected energy goes into the building and increases the the heat or the the, the, the uh, thermal load on the building and therefore requirement for cooling. But you may also see that the, the the lighting needs may be reduced because you're getting more natural light in the structure. So there's a lot of, of both positive and negative interactions that need to be considered when, when dealing with pavement. But that said, there are plenty, if we consider our cities are about 35 to 40% pavement, there are plenty of applications of pavement that won't be in a uh, tight urban core area that will be that can benefit from cool pavement. And in particular, I'd say this is, at least in the, in the US where we've mostly worked with cool pavement, uh, the, the, our poorest and, and most heat vulnerable neighborhoods also tend to be our most paved neighborhoods and they don't tend to be the most uh, dense areas. So there are real opportunities to apply cool pavement as a solution set in, in, in those contexts. Now, the, the other thing I'd mention here is comparing cool roofs to cool pavements in terms of the products that are available. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, I think cool roofs have been, if you consider the cool roof as a, in the modern, the modern technologies that we think of as a cool roof, They've been around for 30 years or more in some cases. So there's been a lot of innovation, a lot of, uh, a lot of product availability across all manner of different types of roofs. Cool pavements are really a, essentially a brand new technology. They've been you know, conceptually around for about you know, 15, 20 years, but really in terms of application, uh, it is not, they, they, they don't have the same length of time and there's not the same amount of products available and the same number of companies making them. So we're still in a much earlier stage in terms of understanding how cool pavements work and understanding the economics of cool pavements, understanding the life cycle costs of cool pavements and so on versus what we have for roofs. So I, I think that we can't, uh, we see it's imperative that we move the ball forward in terms of innovation on cool pavements because they're essential. We need to be thinking of our pavements as part of the cooling solution rather than a, a part of the problem. Uh, but I think that we're still in the early stages, we being the, the world, and are in the early stages of, of getting a, a robust industry in this space. And, and this applies everywhere, not just uh, in, if this is in the US, uh, Europe, uh, everywhere. Um, in fact, I'd say we even have a very limited number of cities that have applied cool pavements at anything more than a small scale. I mean, Tokyo, Melbourne, Los Angeles, and now Phoenix. So we have a long way to go to understanding how Cool pavements work, but there is a real imperative that we do it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schickman. So it's not uh, either and or, it's not an option. So basically it's a concerted efforts among stakeholders and actors to cool this planet. So you contribute in cooling uh, the roof and also other people can also contribute in terms of cooling the pavement. Thank you very much. Um, we move forward to our last but not least question. This is uh, due, to the, due to the interest of time. So I would like to um, read the question raised from Professor Baoji uh, to uh, Mr. Shikman. So what is your opinion on the negative impacts of existing cooling strategies in urban design? For instance, cool pavement can help reduce surface temperature significantly, while it also leads to glazing problem. Any suggestion for urban planner and designer? So uh, Professor Baoji is addressing question from Australia. Mr. Sigmund, please. Great, thanks. 
Uh, so I guess some of my answer from the previous one applies here since we're talking about cool pavements, but, uh, and I guess I would just reiterate that, uh, you know, there is the integrated approach to this rather than taking a single measure approach is important, not just because there's symbiosis between these measures, but they can also help mitigate some of the challenges we see uh, from some of these in certain contexts. So I think, you know, uh, particularly when we're talking about surface level interventions like cool pavements, having an understanding of uh, the, the local context in which they're being put in is going to be really important to determining what the positive and negative impact will be. More broadly, uh, I think as we've done a better job understanding the economic and impacts across all the different systems and effects that, that, that uh, rising heat or or cooling or mitigation strategies can have, uh, we're doing a better job of, of, of understanding those trade-offs, both physical and economic. And in, in most cases, investing in passive cooling in our cities at, at, a, at a scale uh, is, a, is, a, is a advantageous thing to do. And I think where we really just need to be careful are on those specific instances where uh, that you, it may not be, there's certain technologies may not be applicable in a certain space. Now, just let me, I guess, put a finer point on that and say, you know, I've heard, I've seen a lot of folks talk about the thermal issues related to reflected solar energy onto pedestrians uh, and into buildings from cool pavement. Uh, we've seen firsthand in, in Los Angeles that the, the, the changes in, in color from a cool pavement are very similar to walking off of a concrete sidewalk and into an asphalt street. So we're not talking about a, a, a brilliant, blindingly white pavement. So I think some of that is, has not been uh, uh, borne out in, in the in the re, in the reality of of the deployments that, that that we've seen, and certainly there is a case where also deploying shade trees. If you're going to have a cool pavement where you have lots of pedestrians, we get the best benefit for, from thermal comfort for uh, pairing the shade with the solar reflective pavements. So I think it's really thinking about these things in a in that sort of integrated way uh, as a as a set of measures to get the the impact we're looking for, rather than individual. Uh, positives and negatives that, that we're finding uh, uh, to be the most, sort of most effective strategy for getting deployment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schickman, for your elaborate answer to the questions. Now, um, due to the interest of time, we will conclude this session. Thank you very much for all our keynote speakers for their uh, presentation and sharing their knowledge and expertise uh, this morning. And um, Briefly, please allow me to give some uh, resume and stitch together the presentation of our keynote speakers, three keynote speakers today. Uh, Professor Anumba has highlighted the importance of built environment resilience, incorporating the built environment, the critical infrastructure, and also the buildings. How uh, the importance of building in that resiliency framework. Mr. Sigmund focused on how cooling the roof will also contribute in cooling this planet. And he also mentioned in the question and answer session that cooling the roof is not all the only approach to cool this planet. It has to be a concerted effort among stakeholders and contributors to do this all together. And our third keynote speaker also highlight the importance of public urban space, the public space in between the buildings. Those public spaces need to be uh, incorporated in our action to tackle the building, uh, to tackle all the challenges and issues that are faced by our world today. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we will also take this opportunity to have a photo documentation of this keynote, spatia, uh, keynote session with all keynote speakers and participants of this conference. So I believe that our conference host will take gallery screenshot of participant screen. Therefore, please activate your camera function and pose with your best smile and hold it for a couple of seconds because uh, we'll have several um, screens uh, and also we have to wait for several screenshots in order for our old pictures to be taken. So please put on your best smile and wait for the host to take a screenshot. On the count of three, 
One, two, three. Next screen, please. One, two, three. Next. Next screen, please. And another screen, because we have plenty of participants keen on participating in this conference and keynote session. Another one. Okay, thank you very much. We hope that all the knowledge and expertise shared in this keynote special, uh, session will be beneficial to all of us. And this presentation open opportunities for future collaborations among participants and institutions participated in this very occasion. So with that, Mm, I would like to conclude our keynote special, a keynote special session. Thank you very much for your attention and my sincere apology for any shortcomings from my side when moderating this session. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now back to the master of ceremony. <laughs> Thank you, Ibu for taking us for taking us for the one. Now we're going now, to have a five minute break, 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 break for the party's conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be three Zoom links in the chat box. You may join one of them based on your research interest. For your information, for room one, the theme is sustainable built design with Professor Rafi Sinifasan from Florida University, USA, and Associate Professor Tetsu Kubota from Hiroshima University, Japan, as the invited speakers. The session will be led by Associate Professor Usep Surahman from the Department of Architectural Education of Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. For room two, the theme is Urban Meteorology and Climate Adapting to Global Change with Professor Hamzan Ahmad from UTM Malaysia and Associate Professor Pao Chi Hye from UNSW Australia as the invited speakers. The station will be led by Dr. Rerna Nandi from the Department of Geographical Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. For Room 3, the theme is Urban Environmental Education and Urban Social Issue and Economics with Associate Professor Dr. Engbeta Paramita from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia and Associate Professor Pawini Iam Tarakul from Tamasat University, Thailand as the invited speakers. The session will be led by Associate Professor Tutin Arianti, PhD from the Department of Architectural Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. To the participants, please click the Zoom link as shown in the chat box accordingly. Thank you. Thank you.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi washabbihi ajmain amma ba'du. First of all, uh, let us pray and praise to Allah Subhanahu wa taala because because of his place and mercy we can come together without any obstacle here with healthy condition in the plenary session in the room one. Let's begin with uh, basmalah bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am Usab Surahman, a lecturer at the Department of Architectural, Architectural Education of UP, uh, as shown in this brief CV, and I will be the moderator of this session. I think I do not need to read uh, my CV uh, because it has been shown here. Uh, the Honorable Associate Professor Rafi Sankar Srinivasan from University of Florida and Associate Professor Tetsuko Bota uh, from Hiroshima University, as well as all beloved participants of SENFAR. Uh, very good morning, and it has been late in Florida, so very good evening, Professor Rafi. Welcome to this plenary session in room one, uh, whose scope is Sustainable Build Design. Ladies and gentlemen, on this next occasion, let me deliver the structure uh, of the event today. Uh, as follow the seminar will be comprising four sessions session one is the speech from uh professor rafi sankar sinifasan and session two will be the question and answer because uh, it has been very late in uh, florida uh so professor rafi will do first and the third session is the speech from uh, professor tetsuko bota and the last session is question and answer for Professor Tetsukubota. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have some question for both while uh, they are presenting, please write in chat room, and therefore the host will arrange the list of questions for question and answer sessions. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, now we come into the main point of this plenary session that Professor Rafi will share his deep knowledge valuable experience and best practices for us in sustainable build design entitled artificial intelligence and the build environment emerging technologies in research however please let me read brief cv of professor rafi before his talk uh, rafi sankar sinifasan obtained his phd in architecture focusing on building technology from university of pennsylvania philadelphia united states he obtained academic awards such as Holland Professor and University of Professor. He published uh, two books, uh, many journals and papers. He obtained many international certification such as Green Globe Professional, Energy Manager, and US Green Building Council. His research, his research interests are low or net zero energy buildings, building energy efficiency, building energy modeling, sustainability, smart cities, uh, Parkinson and virtual reality, and also construction of smart house. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Associate Professor Rafi Sangkar Sinipasan. Professor, screen and time are yours, please. Uh, Professor Wilson, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, so, okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for um, inviting me. And uh, um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, somebody. And then uh, good night, very few people. I think there are some people sitting in this part of the world. Uh, I'm sitting in Florida, Gainesville. And uh, before I start, you know, I've been kind of very busy watching news. <laughs> okay. Again. Okay. Anyway, so, you know, that's, that's part of the life. Okay. Uh, before I start, I just want to kind of recognize uh, something, uh, which is a million cold roofs challenge. Uh, my friend Kurt Chickman uh, presented a few minutes ago. Um, uh, both of us kind of work on some of the projects. So, um, uh, you know, Professor Bubeta was actually here in Gainesville. Uh, this was actually before the COVID. And then uh, we had a wonderful meeting with the Dean Anumba. And then um, I've been to uh, the University of Pendinikan twice, actually. I've spent quite a bit of time there. I met uh, Professor Didi, so my sincere regards to Professor Didi. 
And then my sincere regards to um, all of the faculty I've met at the um, University of Pendanikan. So this is in our website. We talk about everything. Uh, Vuveta actually gave us an interview as well. I just want to put it out there and tell you that, you know, we do have a very good relationship with uh, your university. So um, at any point in time, you know, we would kind of you know, expand this cooperation and then kind of potentially bring some of you as faculty to work with us. And then we will also send some of students to your university. Okay, so that being said, I just want to start off with my presentation. Um, so, okay. Um, uh, Professor Yusuf, can you see my uh, slides? Yes, very clearly. Okay, perfect. So I'm just trying to move things around. I don't know which is a better way. Okay, this is the closest I could do. Okay. So my topic today is um, the use of artificial, inter artificial intelligence in the built environment, um, emerging technologies and research. And uh, I love this conference. I want to kind of again, thank Professor Bubeta for inviting me to uh, speak at this plenary. At the same time, I also want to thank uh, Professor Didi and all of the faculty for inviting me and all of the participants who have taken time to um, join the symposium. It's a wonderful symposium. Um, I thought it's, it's very important for us to talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, the reason is with all uh, technology development that's actually happening with so much amount of data, we talk about sensors everywhere. The moment you hold a cell phone, you have like another 20 to 30 different sensors situated in the cell phone, which would record everything, your voice, your location. Uh, you know, it could also record the temperatures and humidity and so on and so forth. So the question is, you know, is there any way that we could actually use all of this information and then potentially even predict something new, okay? So there are some rule-based systems which we can use, but rule-based systems go only to a certain level. Beyond that, there is no way we could actually use it, right? So that's one of the reasons why we need to look for um, artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques. And uh, as you may know, um, uh, my, my background is in architecture, uh, building technology, as well as civil engineering. And then I've, uh, I've kind of you know, worked on a lot of these different things. I thought you know, it's, imp it's important for me to share my experiences with all of you so that at some point in time, maybe we could collaborate on some other research. Okay, so that said, um, I just want to move on. I just want to kind of give you a flavor of what is this, what, what we're talking about, right? So the concept of artificial intelligence is being used in different domains right now, literally. Okay, for example, if you take Bridgestone, one of those largest tire manufacturers in the world, they use it for the tire wear. The question is, you know, when does the tire wear such a way that we should alert the drivers to change? It is not just the depth, it's more than that. Is it the driving habit? Is it the, um, if I can acquire, acquire the driving habit, um, if I can acquire the car, the, the way the wheels move and so on and so forth, the type of car, is it possible for me to kind of uh, understand and predict and tell the driver, that, hey, you know what, you have to go and change your tires before you're going to have an accident. There are so many other domains where AI has been used or machine learning has been used in this automation. What about telecom? What about energy and finance? Uh, the one energy and finance is actually one of the most critical component because they do it for forecasting. The question here is, uh, what is the price that such large utility companies have to pay for, let's say natural gas, um, because they buy in bulk and then they kind of you know, distribute to the customers and they make money but they have to make some predictive analysis in order for them to you know, uh, save money, make profit, right? It's all about risk analysis and uh, prediction and forecasting. And even in some of the BMWs, right? They're working towards uh, oversteering the car, okay? Um, interestingly, uh, you know, um, um, I have a car which was bought last year. Pretty much if I don't steer, if I'm not on the steering wheel, it goes across the lane, automatically pulls me back to the lane. I don't need to do anything, okay? So there are some kind of autonomous uh, systems are kind of you know, in place already. Same thing with building energy optimization. So the question is, am I supposed to kind of you know, run my washing machine and the dryer right now, or should I just leave it for the, the little intelligent, uh, intelligent box, uh, smart box that sits in the house to take care of the, the way how it's going to run, right? A lot of different things and so on and so forth, right? So um, these are some of the different domains uh, where EA is used and I'll specifically focus on buildings because that is where um, my, my expertise lies. Okay, there are three different things which I want to talk about in this particular uh, you know, presentation. One is um, when we talk about you know, AI, right? So 
one of the most uh, places where DA is used is when the solution is too complex for handwritten rules to equations. A very simple example is speech recognition, right? So how do you recognize speech? There is no way we could kind of, you know, um, write rule-based system for such a thing. Object recognition, how do we know this particular car is, could be a Nissan car, right? Is it depending on the shape? And then it's very difficult to write rules because, you know, car could be in different angles, different shape and so on and so forth. But how do you do that? So in these kinds of things, what they do is they use nonlinear relationships to kind of determine. Um, if you look at the second part, right? I mean, where uh, things have to change because of changing data. One thing which I'm going to talk about today is also about the prediction models, which are used for, um, you know, a future prediction of energy use. I'm talking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. How do you do this? Because you kind of understand all of the data which you have right now based on all of the historical information. And then you build the model, you kind of, you know, refine the model, and then you, you kind of remove this uh, error. It's very difficult to remove the error, but at least reduce the error and then kind of move on to the next level. So uh, the third one is all about uh, solutions that meet scale, uh, for example, tax availability. And these couple of slides, I took it from uh, MathWorks because it's a very, very relevant. I really wanted to recognize uh, their work uh, in terms of all of these modules, what they have as part of MATLAB. Okay, so uh, before I start, I want, also want to kind of recognize my lab. It's called the ERPSIS lab. Uh, the ERPSIS is the Urban Building Energy Sensing Controls Building Data Analysis and Visualization Lab. Um, I would welcome all of you when you come to Florida and uh, this is how the lab was designed. And then, um, you know, I'll show you a picture of our lab also, which is the last slide. And I also want to kind of recognize my PhD students. Uh, uh, five of the PhD students actually graduated. They're all well settled in different parts of the world, um, China, most of them in the US. Um, and then I have four PhD students who are working with me right now. It's um, it's Heikyu, um, Hezang, Jitin, and Deepak. They're all working on various different things. And we, uh, in the lab, we focus on three different, uh, you know, areas. One is modeling and simulation, where we talk about, um, you know, modeling small buildings, one building, cluster of buildings, could be campus buildings, which is the university campus, or we could also think about modeling the entire city of Gainesville, or more than that, right? So how do you model this? There are multiple different ways to model this, and then we'll talk about this in a minute. We also focus on air quality modeling, indoor air quality, and so on and so forth. Uh, the second component, what we do in our lab um, is to do with simulation visualization. It is not uh, enough if you do simulation, but the question is, can we visualize the data to understand, to grasp information, so on and so forth. The third one, what we do is the virtual reality and augmented reality. We do have a lot of equipment in our lab. Um, we, we have uh, two drones. This is one of the one oldest drone. We just bought a new drone uh, that has a couple of different cameras, the infrared thermography and so on and so forth. So we can have, you know, use all of these equipment and so on and so forth, right? We do have um, air quality sensors, which we purchase, but we also kind of, you know, um, put to their own sensors because of the cost factor. And we have gate mat and so on and so forth. Basically, it's kind of a mat and uh, it's a mat of nearly about two feet by three feet. And then each of those mat has close to 70,000 sensors. Pretty much you walk on the mat, you'll be able to kind of get the pressure points and everything. So we would use that to kind of uh, understand the movement of gait, which is a leg. So far, we have close to $1.3 million of research proposals. Recently, in the last few months, um, um, uh, you know, I, I secured an NSF grant as a PI. It's a planning grant for 150K uh, just for 12 months. And then we'll be submitting a full proposal next year, which is for 1.5 million for three years um, and so on and so forth. So I just want to kind of you know, give you a flavor of what we do in our lab before we move on. One of the things what we do uh, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, buildings, building uh, is a specific thing. And then uh, what I'm going to talk about is the application domain. So there are two application domains, which is specific. One is focusing on one single building, understanding in terms of its energy use, occupant behavior, airflow, optimal location of vents and so on and so forth. The second thing is I want to talk about in terms of urban scale. Uh, when you talk about urban scale, we're talking about multitudes of buildings, we're talking about hundreds of buildings. In the case of the city of Gainesville, we're talking about 42,000 single family residential homes. So that's a lot of buildings. And assume that, you know, each particular building, we have like, you know, uh, three data points. 
let's say one data point, which is electricity, with one data point, and then we're talking about the data point, you know, um, every hour for the year. So you multiply that by 42,000. So that's the kind of data points we're talking about. But, you know, some of the information we don't have yet, but we do have information in terms of uh, electricity consumption over the month. Uh, for several years, we can abuse that information. And then for some of the buildings within the university campus, we kind of, you know, have hourly data also. So those are the things. Uh, I'll be kind of, you know, touching upon all of these different, you know, concepts and some of the work, what we have done so that you'll kind of, you know, understand uh, what we do, how we do, and uh, maybe also potentially encourage you to do something similar to what I'm doing. So before we start on, I just want to give you the roadmap in terms of the structure of the machine learning. So we do have two different types. One is a supervised learning. The other one is unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is nothing but the developing predictive models based on the inputs and outputs. So basically you're building a relationship between inputs and outputs. And then, you know, you could kind of remove some of the variables and so on and so forth, uh, because, you know, they kind of have some kind of collinearity, but then you could kind of, you know, try to reduce the error. Once you're done, then you kind of have the inputs and then you will have an output. The other one is unsupervised, which is discovering the internal representation using just an input. Basically what it means is we don't know what the output is, we don't understand this, but what we could do is we, we call something called clustering. We could cluster. Uh, let me give an example. Let's say we have uh, at the University of Florida, we have 2000 buildings, different small, large, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, if you take the different types of building types, for example, you have buildings which are hospitals, buildings that are primarily classrooms, buildings that are primarily you know, just office spaces, right? And so on and so forth. A lot of different types of buildings are there. It's very easy for us to kind of, you know, add uh, multiple different, you know, characteristics of buildings, and then we run a clustering algorithm, and then it would cluster buildings into different clusters. And then if you look at the buildings, hospitals, all of the hospitals would be in kind of one of the clusters. Um, the office buildings could be one of the clusters. The cluster buildings would have one. The lab buildings would be one. It is not just based on the energy use, but it's also based on the other characteristics, but you know, we could actually cluster them. So if you look at supervised learning, there are at least you know, two, which is regression classification. And then if you look at unsupervised, again, there are two, which is clustering and reinforcement learning. What I'm going to show you in the next slide is kind of you know, how um, I'm going to kind of discuss this particular uh, present, this, the structure of the presentation right now. So if you focus on regression, we have individual buildings, um, again, we do have urban buildings. Within the urban buildings, I'm going to talk about energy use. At the same time, uh, I'm going to also going to talk about energy leakages at a much larger scale. Um, classification, I'm going to give you a very interesting example, which is to do with the lowest floor elevation. It's kind of a very interesting term, which I learned uh, a year ago. And uh, uh, you know, uh, this is based on the NSF uh, National Science Foundation grant. I'll talk about this in just a few minutes. If you look at clustering, I'm, talk, I'm going to kind of give you um, uh, very basic information about clay means clustering, spectral clustering, uh, things we're actually working on uh, as part of a new proposal, which we are working on. And then, um, and then the last one is actually reinforcement learning. Uh, I also want to point out that um, pretty much all of this, uh, you know, AI, my interest in AI, everything started in 2004 when I was a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. This is in Philadelphia. So um, I'm kind of, I focused more on the reinforcement learning. This is what you see here. And then what I've done here is I've kind of um, organized pretty much all of this work based on either if it's a student work or if it is part of a proposal, which I'm actually working on, as you see here. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about these. And then if you see this one, which says NIH, NIHR21, NIH is the National Institute of Health. It's, it's in the US. And then, you know, I just submitted a proposal. Um, what we are proposing there is using a Bayesian neural network to kind of, you know, um, allow the vent, you know, the vent, uh, the supply vent in the room. So we want the supply vent in the room to change not just the airflow, but also the direction and, uh, and a lot of different parameters based on an understanding of the interior. If you remember COVID is, uh, uh, you know, COVID kind of, you know, played a major role in all of these new designs. And what we're proposing is not only locating the supply in the return duct inside the operation theater of a hospital room, but also kind of allow the ventilation duct to kind of change the location, to rotate and so on and so forth. 
So for that, we are actually using a Bayesian neural network. This proposal is under review, so um, I won't be able to disclose too much on that, but at least I want to tell you what I'm working on. I will talk about all of these, and then um, the, the, one, um, the one what you see here, uh, which has been highlighted in yellow or light orange, are the ones uh, uh, based on um, the research grants, recent research, research grants. Okay, there are other things also, which is actually happening. Okay, so I want to go back and talk about um, the learning workflow. This is again a slide from the MathWorks, um, the creators of MATLAB. So basically there are four different steps in any of the machine learning concept, it's a workflow. The first one is um, accessing and exploring data. So in this case, what happens is we need data. Data is a key. So there are multiple ways to kind of gather data. One is kind of scanning data from a PDF file or from images. You have OCR scanners. You would have to refine all of your algorithms to kind of get the data into the database. The other way you could do that is also kind of to extract data from sensors. As I told you, cell phones do have sensors, right? A lot of different sensors. You could actually gather a lot of data from the sensors too. And then there is a lot of other work, which is called data cleanup. I still kind of, you know, listen to my PhD students where they say that they spend quite a bit of time to clean the data. And that's a major work, but it has to be done. Otherwise, you won't be able to run your model. The second thing is you also want to kind of, you know, reduce, uh, we could also call this as the dimensionality reduction, where you have to reduce the variables. Um, you know, you could run some um, multicollinearity tests and so on and so forth, try to reduce variables so that you can actually have one of those significant variables to be used for running the data. The third step is, once you have the input data, once you have the output data, you could actually kind of, you know, uh, run predictive models by kind of building the relationship. It's called the model creation. If you're looking at unsupervised learning, what happens is you would use input data and then you cluster them, you understand, or, uh, you know, all of the other processes you could actually work on. One of the important concept in um, AI is you have to validate. That's very important because, it's not like, you know, it's doing something and you don't validate. You have to kind of validate to see whether it makes a lot of sense. And then the last one is to kind of integrate whatever the learned model is in the actual application. Uh, one thing I just want to let you know is in the research domain, at least what um, we work here uh, at the lab, OFSIS lab, we focus more on the first three where we kind of develop and we kind of refine, but we are kind of very weak with the last one. And uh, the reason is, you know, we keep moving on to other research, new research. Um, recently, you know, a couple of our work has been uh, um, given the provisional patent at the U.S. Uh, patent uh, office. So kind of now we are getting back to kind of complete it so that we can actually have some apps available for others to use also. So hopefully uh, we'll have all this information available to you guys. Okay, uh, that said, I'm kind of, you know, um, uh, going to talk about uh, some examples of some of the work. This is the University of Pennsylvania. This was in 2004, as I told you. The larger question here is, can we um, uh, simulate YAD flow? You know, YAD flow simulation, typically we use computational fluid dynamics or CFD. The question is, can we kind of use some kind of technique to kind of uh, run real-time YAD flow simulations, especially when you want to kind of, you know, um, uh, you know run some similar experiments. A good example is, which you can see it from my website uh, is augmented reality setup where I can just walk into the room, use a head monitor device, augmented reality, use a cyber glove, and then, and then experience the data. What I'm talking about is the flow of air and so on and so forth, can visualize that. In such cases, CFD may not be able to help us. The reason is CFD takes more time, right? So can we use real-time yet flow? So that was one of the work, it was published. This was another work which was published in 2004 where we were trying to optimize the location of the supply and the return duct inside the building. Um, basically, because we wanted to kind of uh, improve the air quality, at the same time, we also wanted to reduce uh, the, uh, you know, all sorts of things, for example, or improve the thermal comfort, right? So this was also published um, uh, in 2004, 2005 time. And part of this work has been used for um, the recent proposal, which I submitted to the NIH, uh, which is focused on the optimal location of supply and return ducts, in addition to also making a dynamic um, supply ventilation system that would kind of optimally, you know, make sure that the COVID, the viruses don't uh, stay in any space within the room. They are kind of, you know, eliminated, exhausted out. Okay, this is one of the work uh, of my student, uh, which he completed. 
this was a couple of years ago. This is called ensemble models. This is something which some of you guys may be interested in. Uh, the problem with the single regression model is you, know, you would be able to see that the error is kind of on the higher side. What you could do is you could kind of use uh, something called an ensemble model. So basically what happens is you would have multiple different regression models. Let's say you have a data, you could kind of you know, split the data into multiple small, small batches and then you would, or I would say bags, and then you would create uh, multiple regression trees as you see here. You have a data subset and then you would kind of have regression tree one, two, three, four, and N. And then you kind of create an ensemble bagging tree. And then once you have that information, you'll be able to you know, get a better uh, result. Basically, when I talk about better result, I'm talking about uh, reduced error compared to a simple single regression model, okay? So this work has been published already. This was published in 2018 in the Energy and Buildings. It's one of the most recognized um, um, journal for buildings and energy. We have, we have a lot of publications to this end as well. The second one, which I'm very much interested in, is actually occupant behavior. Okay, think about yourself in the room, right? You're sitting in the room, you're sitting, I don't know, wherever you're sitting right now. Um, one thing what happens here is, I'm just gonna have it here. So one thing what happens here is, um, we all kind of, you know, uh, we all kind of interact with the windows or the doors, right? For example, what happens if the outside um, condition is much better than the inside in terms of temperature? There is a possibility for us to kind of open the door or open the window because we wanted to get fresh air from the outside or the inside, uh, or the outside condition is much more cooler than the inside, right? We could, we could do that. Um, if you look at the building energy modeling programs, including the Energy Plus, uh, which is widely used all over the world, they focus on occupant numbers and some of the uh, information of the occupant in terms of the physiology, but they do not focus on occupant behavior. So when you talk about behavior, I'm talking about the behavior of the occupant with the different uh, elements, which is the windows, doors, and so on and so forth, right? So this is one of the work we have done. Again, if you look at the International Energy Agency, they have identified occupant behavior as one of the major factor, okay? And uh, very less people have actually worked on this particular area. We also did a literature review. Um, this was in 2017 or 15. Um, and then we found that most of the work actually focuses on occupant numbers, but not on occupant behavior. So that was kind of very interesting for us. And we said, you know what, let's only focus on that. So we did uh, um, a kind of a model. So it has three objectives. The first objective is building an agent-based model. Agent-based model uh, modeling is nothing but developing an agent that kind of represents a set of, um, uh, which has a set of features, okay? In the case of uh, my past student's work, he used me as an experiment, kind of a guinea pig, right? So he said, okay, you know, Dr. Ravi, I want to use you as an experiment. So he looked at some of my goals, standards and preferences in terms of, you know, how I want to kind of, you know, maintain my home environment and so on and so forth. So this is the goals, standards and preferences. We also looked at the perceptual types and most of these come from standards. We have the kind of behavior definition. So once you have all of those things, it's called the agent-based modeling. And then we also gathered data from inside the building and then we used a co simulation network. Basically it would link the Energy Plus with the agent-based modeling program. So basically it will kind of go back and forth for AVR. So that was the model. So what is, an, what is an ABM consists of? ABM consists of a set of agents, a set of rules, and an environment for simulating the agent behaviors and interactions. Fortunately, when I was doing a PhD at Penn, this was in 2007, uh, I was sitting in a class, um, electrical engineering graduate class, and then I learned that there was a program which was called the Performance Moderator Function or PM Observe. So um, 10 years after that, you know, I told my student, you know what, maybe I can actually request a copy of a license to use that, so we actually used it. Let me give you a very simple example of how it works. So for any input based on the situation, what happens is typical systems would actually use a rule-based um, uh, system, right? Rule-based solution. For example, you know, the temperature is more than this, close the window. That's very simple rule-based. But what happens at an agent-based model is that the agent has its own preferences. It actually goes to two, and then it goes to this one, which is the personal properties, as I told you. And then it also goes to the goals, standards and preferences of the agent. And then it creates an utility and then it goes back to this action. And then depending on the highest utility, there is an output. So this is not a simple rule-based system. Had this been a simple rule-based system, 
it would have not gone to three, it would have said we gone to two and been out, okay? So what we did was we used uh, the building control virtual test bed um, to kind of, you know, use as a program that would connect the energy plus uh, to the ABM. I don't want to go through the details. It's all available in the paper. You can actually see those things, okay? So once we did this, we were able to kind of understand the way how we behave. So basically what we did was we developed an agent which resembles my behavior. And then we also had systems in place to kind of validate the data from sensors in my room, door sensors, window sensors, um, environmental sensors, and so on and so forth to see how close they were. The good thing is once we understand or be able to build that agent very close to the actual person, we can allow simulations to show how much um, uh, energy I could save by changing some of the behaviors. And that was that is hugely missing right now. Okay, so that's what it is. So we do have uh, quite a bit of publications. This was again published in the Energy Buildings. When you get time, you can actually go back and see this. Um, all right, the other example is uh, the campus building. This is again building energy consumption. So what we've done here is we looked at the future energy consumption of the University of Florida campus. So this is the methodology. The paper is available online as a journal paper. We use two different techniques. One is the ARIMA method, which is the auto regressive integrated moving average uh, because it's a time series data. The second one we used was the long short term memory or LSTM. Okay, so we were able to kind of, you know, uh, predict. The larger question here is, you know, when we predict 20 years from now because of climate change, how do you validate? You know, the answer is no, it's very difficult to validate because it's 20 years from now, right? So what we do is, before we do that prediction, we kind of predict, we kind of use all the previous year's data and then we predict for this year and then we compare, we validate and then straight away we use the future data. In this case, we use the data for 2041, 2057 and 2063 for the city of Gainesville for a set of buildings. Uh, again, the number of buildings we used was close to 20 or 30, we didn't use 400 buildings. In the, okay, And uh, we do have quite a bit of uh, several papers so yeah, these were some of the papers that were actually published already um, for energy performance forecasting. Uh, one of the recent work which uh, I'm working is with Hei Kyung, um, uh, you know, so uh, this is about, again, prediction, but not in the scale of 10 buildings or 20 buildings, but in the scale of uh, 45,000 buildings. We're talking about the entire city of Gainesville, Florida, right? So we want to understand how, what would be the kind of energy these buildings would consume in 2041, 2057, 2063 for the city of Gainesville. So this was kind of a project. Um, while I was at uh, UPI, I did present uh, the details of the project, uh, mostly on the physics-based approach. So the physics-based approach used Energy Plus. Basically, we would model every building um, in Energy Plus, and then we would use supercomputers to run the simulation for us using the future weather data. So we've done this entire thing. We do have a publication which is available. And then, uh, what we could do, what the problem with the energy plus it takes quite a bit of time, right? So what we need is we need a much more simplistic method. So we go to the data driven method on the left side. So uh, this student actually um, graduated in 2019, but he used a campus. Hakeem is working with me on city scale modeling right now. So we have already modeled the campus in Philadelphia and we're looking at expanding that to the city of Gainesville. So once she's able to model this in the machine, uh, using machine learning, then I'd be able to kind of transfer some of the data to kind of improve from the physics base to the machine learning. We're still working on that. And uh, today um, I learned that, uh, you know, at, in our college uh, design construction planning, I learned that Head Poster was awarded third prize. This is that poster. So I just sent a message to her, I said, you know, why didn't they send me the poster so I can share it with all of you guys. So this is a campus in Philadelphia where we kind of, you know, studied about the impact of climate change. Um, again, we use machine learning, future weather data, and building characteristics. So we won, she won third prize for the poster just today. So it's um, real hot news. The other student, um, he's also my current student. So he's focusing on factors influencing indoor air pollution in education buildings. Especially with COVID, we want to understand more about the indoor air pollution. So um, we have identified 10 different buildings. We have done some preliminary study in a school building in Alachua County, which is uh, part of Gainesville, Florida. And then uh, now we are kind of expanding this. So we're focusing on specific pollution such as NO2, ozone, CO2, PM2.5, PM10, and um, humidity. And uh, we have specific you know, um, uh, protocols which we want to kind of use it. 
and there are certain categorical variables, and then there are some continuous variables as well, which we're going to use. Um, again, I don't want to spend too much time. We do have a, a presentation which is available. And then, you know, if you look at the independent variables, these are some of the variables. It is not just the indoor environment, but we also understand the building, um, uh, the building characteristics, uh, any defects in the building by uh, a walkthrough. And then we use all of those independent variables to kind of uh, predict the outdoor, uh, indoor concentration, sorry, the outdoor concentration plus the building related defects to predict the indoor concentration so that we can go back and see how we can work on these things. So this is what we plan to do. We wanted to kind of reduce the dimension as I told you, um, run some uh, um, multi-collinearity tests and remove some of the variables and then kind of use them to kind of potentially get some better regression models. And I also learned that his poster was awarded second prize today. So literally- Excuse me, Professor Rappi, you have uh, three more minutes. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, so I he, he won, thank, thank you, Professor Wazir. Yes. So I, he won, uh, this student actually won second prize today. So literally two of his students presented and then they won two of the awards. Okay, uh, one of the thing which I wanna talk about is actually the problem with actual implementation of these machine learning models. So we have a publication which is under review right now as we speak. We want to understand all of the practical issues in implementing machine learning models. So uh, hopefully it will be published very soon and I'll be able to share more. The next few slides are the actual work. Uh, this is actually uh, a work which I was funded by the National Science Foundation. In here, we are trying to uh, understand when systems within the air handling unit would fail based on the acoustics, right? So we have actually kind of you know, put together the different cell phones, cell phones would listen to the area, to the all the noise, and then we use uh, spectral clustering to cluster these noises into multiple different equipment, and then we would kind of listen to it long enough to see when it's going to fail. So that's one of the examples here. The most fun fun work is based on the recent National Science Foundation award which I won. We're using drones here. We are trying to identify the lowest floor elevation. If you remember, Dean Anubo was talking about the flood elevation and flooding. So here we want to understand what is the lowest floor elevation uh, that would get flooded, right? So we need to understand this. The problem here is, you know, somebody, a survey going to the site and measuring that would cost money, takes time. The question is, can you do this at, let's say, um, I want to do, I want to run something similar uh, for every hour, I want to get 300 flood elevations, right? So how do you do this? So we are kind of working on the drone. And uh, we're using this drone, and then we're, we're also using the um, UF, University of Florida has a wonderful supercomputer that uses uh, graphic processing units. So we're going to use that as well. And then this is what I was talking about, right? So we have this, we have the ground truth data. So we want to detect the foundation types and prediction of LIPs. So this is under um, undergoing. And then just today, um, um, I got my provisional patent for this particular project approved. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to see more. The second thing which we want to do from the same data is also to understand the envelope energy wastage. So basically we want to speed up all this information. And uh, this is the last slide. This, uh, this was taken um, two weeks ago. Um, I, I'm, right, I'm right in the middle. There are two graduate students. We are six feet apart uh, because of COVID. We are wearing a mask. So we thought, okay, might as well, you know, we have an amazing um, drone with two cameras attached to each, the same. So that's our lab. So that said, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Rafi, for the nice and comprehensive uh, presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, now a session for question and answer. Uh, so, uh, so if there are any uh, questions for uh, Professor Rafi, Please. Yeah, uh, if uh, is there any questions? Ah, okay. Uh, uh, for from the chat room, uh, we can see that uh, uh, there's a question from Randy Perdana Hitmat. Is the occupant's behavior towards energy consumption can be predicted during early design phase pre-occupation? Uh, can you give an example of what is the instrument used to simulate it? Yes. Okay. 
So, um, Professor Rendy, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a good question. So, it's very difficult. Um, it's very difficult to predict uh, occupant behavior in the pre-design phase. The reason is because, uh, look at this way. Okay, when as architects, when we design, right? I'm, I'm actually a licensed architect as well. So when we design, we design for occupants, assuming all of the occupants are the same, right? So um, uh, in terms of number of occupants, go back and look at all of the design uh, documents. Let's say you're designing a school building, right? You design school building based on the number of students sitting in the classroom. So that number of desks are being kind of designed. It is very difficult to kind of identify occupant behavior at that point in time. Uh, this is one of the drawbacks, literally. Uh, again, you know, depending on the physiology of the occupant, the, the interaction of the occupant to the environment changes too, okay? Think about um, a person who is of a different generation than us, uh, where they may have more um, liking towards the environment. They're all focused on cell phones, chatting, Twittering, Facebooking, right? Whereas a different generation wouldn't do that. So basically they would have more and, you know, linked to the environment and they'd be more than happy to open the windows, get more daylight in, right? So maybe that's one thing which we can think about in terms of the physiology, in terms of the aging and how we can, how we can actually perceive uh, how they would be able to operate those components. So that is one thing which we can do. There are no tools, unfortunately. Uh, that's exactly why um, you know, occupant behavior is still a very hot topic. Okay, we have published published a few journals, uh, close to eight, nine conference papers on that. And uh, I'm waiting for my next PhD student to come, which whom I don't know, who can take up this work because occupant behavior is one of the most important topic in building energy simulation. And it's a very good question, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Agafi. Uh, I think because of time limitations. Uh, so if there are still some questions, maybe uh, you can go forward to uh, Professor Gaffi uh, by email, for example. Yeah. Yes, okay. um, my email ID is right here. Uh, yes, Ravi at ufl.edu. Feel free to send me an email. Um, I would uh, uh, recommend you to copy Bubeta also. If you can, okay, because you know I'm in touch with Bubeta pretty much uh, every day. We, we, we text via WhatsApp, so <laughs> please, you know, copy here so that you know. Sometimes, and if I have questions, I'll ask that. Mm -hmm. Hey, what does it mean? And we'll be more than happy. Okay, Professor Uzup and Professor Kubeta Kuboto. I'm, my apologies. I have to. Um, my my tea is gone, <laughs> so which means I need to sleep. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah. uh, Professor Kapi. Before you uh, before leaving, uh, let's do photo session first. Uh, so okay. I will. Uh, I'm. Uh, I move forward uh, the photo session because you are. You are going to leave. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, so, and, ladies uh, and gentlemen, please open your uh, camera. Uh, we will do photo session earlier uh, because Professor Rapi uh, will leave soon. Okay. Please. Uh, please host. Uh, please take a picture for uh, photo sessions. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, and. Uh, um... Okay, uh, one, two, three. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, okay. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and Professor Rafi uh, Srinivasan uh, for being available in this uh, plenary session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, bye, Professor Usup and Professor Kubota. Bye bye. Hopefully, we'll meet once. Bubeta and the Professor Didi and everybody else. Okay. Um, see you very soon. Bye bye. Thanks. Good Thank day. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye -bye. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, now we come into the second uh, invited speaker, which is Professor Tetsu Kubota uh, from Hiroshima University. will also share his deep knowledge, valuable experience, and best practices uh, for us. Uh, uh, we'll, and it will be present a uh, entitled uh, Development of Low Carbon Affordable Apartments in the hot humid climate of Indonesia towards Paris Agreement 2030. However, please let me read brief CV of Professor Tetsuko Bota first before his talk. Uh, Professor Tetsuko Bota obtained his Doctoral of Engineering in Regional Environment System from Sibaura Institute of Technology, uh, Japan. He was, uh, he was visiting Associate Professor in UTM 
and obtained postdoctoral fellow from GSPS. Now he has been being a guest researcher in Pusit Bangkim or Bina Teknik uh, Pekerjaan Umum and published uh, one book, many journals and papers. He just obtained huge grants of Satrap's Science and Technology Research Partnership for five years, approximately uh, 500 million Japanese yen or 60 billion rupiah. His research interests are building an urban environmental science, energy saving building or cities, passive cooling, thermal comfort, ventilation, uh, life cycle assessment, urban heat islands, and environmental education. Ladies and gentlemen, without spending the time, uh, please welcome Professor Tetsu Kubota. Professor, screen and time are yours, uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yusuf Sensei. So, Yusuf Sensei also has been promoted right, to Associate Professor. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, okay. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, I'm Tetsu Kubota. I'm now, yes, uh, talking from Hiroshima, Japan. So, thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful conference. So, uh, just a moment. I just want to share the screen with you. Okay, so yeah, the, really, th thank you very much, Joseph Sensei. Actually, he kindly, as he kindly mentioned, so now we are uh, doing the relatively huge uh, joint research project uh, between Indonesia and Japan. Uh, our counterpart is first the PUSKIM, the PUSRIT Banking, uh, PEU, and also other uh, Indonesian major universities, including, of course, UPI, right? And then we have just started this project. So therefore today, by making use of this opportunity, I just want to introduce our ongoing uh, yeah, joint research project, Satreps, uh, with you. So um, still, we have just pro uh, yeah, started. So therefore the progress is less, not so much, but the, yes, I just want to share with you the contents, idea of this project, and also small, uh, yeah, the ongoing progresses of the project, okay. The title of the project is this, exactly the same as that of the today's presentation title, the development of low carbon, blah, blah, blah. The idea is to develop and propose the new type of, uh, yes, the uh, low carbon affordable apartments for Indonesia towards Paris Agreement. So that is the purpose of the project. Okay. So the, this slide illustrates the yeah, overall concept of the project. So as you can see here, the, this project comprises approximately five components, five research groups, okay, as you can see here, right? So the main goal of this project is, as I probably mentioned, to develop the affordable, you know, low carbon apartments, right? And then eventually we would like to propose the new low carbon standards uh, of uh, apartments, Indonesian apartments for yeah, the Indonesian government. So that is the ultimate goal of this project. So therefore, in a way, yeah, the standardization of the, yes, the apartment is the main goal. So therefore, the, the main component is in a way, number three, the third cluster, building cluster is the main component. But now we realize that the, yeah, in order to standardize the building, I think that, you know, before standardize the building, so we may have to standardize other things at the same time. Okay, one example is yes, climate. Okay, so of course, as you know, the climatic data is so important, right? Even for the building, you know, field, right? For instance, if you conduct uh, some uh, building simulation or maybe energy simulation, for instance, of course, you will use the weather data, right? As an input data. So we, you input the weather data into the simulation and then you normally simulate the indoor you know, thermal environment, or maybe energy, and so on and so forth, right? But now, for instance, in Indonesia, right, we don't have, you know, our own standard weather data, so-called, yeah, standard weather data, so-called TMY, uh, right? So therefore, the, sometimes, you know, we use the weather data from Singapore, for instance, or sometimes you just borrow the data from Ashray, for instance, and then you do the simulation in Indonesia, right? So 
in that case, of course, you know, that you cannot obtain the standard, you know, the results, right? Because you use the different way the data, sometimes Singapore, sometimes US, for instance. So in that case, you cannot obtain the proper accurate results, right? So this means that, yes, before standardize the building, we need to standardize the weather data first, actually, right? Normally, yes, the, yeah, Japan, for instance, yes, we have our own so-called TMY, standard weather data, actually. We developed the standard weather data a long time ago. The, uh, I just forgot anyway. And then well, every, anyone, everybody use it, actually, yeah, when we do the yeah, building simulation. I, I believe that, yes, we need to develop our own, yeah, the weather data, standard weather data in Indonesia as well. So that is the idea of the, yes, number one cluster, the climate group. Okay, so in this group, yeah, we are going to develop the, yes, the Indonesian own the standard weather data together with the Japanese professors and also BM Kage. Okay, so, and then the, our target is 2030. So because I, 2030 is the, as you know, the, the target year of the Paris Agreement. So therefore I believe very important, right? So then uh, even in 2030, I believe that the, yes, the uh, urban climate will be changed, right? Because of the heat island and also the, because of the global warming. Now, as of course, you know that the, right, the temperature is rising and rising. So even by 2030, probably the urban temperature in major cities of Indonesia will be changed, will be warmed probably. So therefore we need to predict the future urban climate of Indonesia, uh, first of all. So therefore in the same group climate. So we also, we will predict the future urban climate of major cities of Indonesia, together with also Japanese professor uh, uh, from Nagoya University. Okay, so two things. First, we predict the future urban climate of Indonesia major cities. Uh, and then after that, we develop, establish our own Indonesian uh, standard weather data, uh, not only for current condition, but also for future condition. Okay, so that is the purpose of the uh, yeah, cluster number one climate. Human number two. This is also, I think that you can easily understand, right? The, yeah, the so-called yeah, thermal comfort standard is also just like climate, you know, important, right? Of course, uh, we normally, you know, design the indoor environment based on the, you know, thermal comfort, right? So, so therefore the thermal comfort criteria is needless to say so important in designing the indoor environment, right? But still, again, so we don't have our own, you know, the thermal comfort standard, right, for Indonesia. So therefore we normally use the, you know, the, yeah, the thermal comfort standard from, again, ASHRAE, for instance, or maybe ISO Europe, right? So, but in now, of course, I know, as you know that, yeah, that we are still not sure whether the, such an international thermal comfort standard can really accurately assess the condition of the tropics in Indonesia, right? Because, you know, the, our thermal sensation is different, right? Especially, I believe that, the, you know, the capability of sweating, for instance, or physiological, you know, the capability of uh, human is uh, right, different, right? Between Jap even Japanese and also the Indonesian people, right? So, but the, still, you know, the, regardless of the, this kind of difference of the human body system, so we, you know, uniformly use the same, you know, the international standard, which is in a way dangerous, right? So therefore, yes, uh, in this, you know, human group, so we, uh, together with, you know, the uh, Indonesian team, so we are going to develop our own Indonesian own, uh, yeah, the thermal comfort standard. Okay, so that's the idea of the number two human. Okay, so based on this standardization, so I believe, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, so yeah, before standardizing the building, so we may have to standardize these other things, you know, climate, as well as human thermal comfort, then we develop the, yeah, the building techniques, the low carbon building techniques, right? So that's a number three, building. Uh, group number four is energy. Energy is the main role is assessment. Uh, after they brought our own building techniques, so the building team, sorry, energy team will assess the, our proposed, you know, building techniques 
in terms of energy as well as in terms of CO2 emissions. And then, yeah, because our target is to meet the Paris Agreement. So therefore, the, you know, the, yeah, the energy team just assess whether we uh, propose building technique can really achieve the, you know, the Paris Agreement target or not. Okay, that's an energy team. Okay. And then the uniqueness of this project, Satrep's project is actually the, you know, number five, implementation. You know, after doing this kind of basic fundamental studies, we go one step further. Oh, that is implementation, number five. Okay, this is interesting part actually. Yeah. So, and yeah, after doing the fundamental studies, okay, we do, uh, we go for the practice, implement all the things. Implementation number one is yes, uh, we will construct a full scale experimental house, right? As you can see here. Actually, yes, in the already, uh, thanks to the previous project, we have already uh, constructed one huge full scale experimental house in the town of Tegal, area, very, very, very difficult to pronounce. Tegal, Tegal, okay? Yeah? Right, yeah, I think you know, right? And then the, we also, will, uh, we, we are going to construct one more experimental house in the same site, Tegal. Okay? And then we would like to make the Tegal town as a pioneering town in terms of the low carbon. Okay, so that's number one implementation. And after constructing the full scale experimental house, two, right, experimental houses, and then the number two implementation is yes, we will incorporate all our research results into the national standard, which is SNI, the your national standard, the standard national in uh, Indonesia, SNI. Okay, so that's implementation number two. Number three implementation is, yes, this is also a unique point, actually. So we all again go to Tigal, local authority, and then we, again, we incorporate all our research resources into the local authorities level uh, compulsory building codes. Okay, because, you know, SNI sometimes is not compulsory, right? But then the, at the local level, they have some compulsory building regulations, right? referring to the SNI. So therefore, yes, we uh, go to Tegalu and then the, try to convince them to make use of our proposed SNI and then incorporate them into their, you know, compulsory local level, you know, building regulations. So that is the final, you know, the goal of this project. It's, uh, you know, quite ambitious, but the, we will do that, okay. And then I believe, as I mentioned, 2030 would be quite important because the target year of the Paris Agreement. Now, maybe public awareness towards low carbon is maybe, I don't know, but not so sure in Indonesia. Maybe not so, you know, the uh, very high probably, right? But the, towards the 2030, the target year of the you know, Paris Agreement, most probably the, you know, public awareness towards the low carbon will get improved increase and increase, right? At the time, tw as of 2030, right? And then, you know, if we do small but very high quality, you know, the pioneering low carbon project in a small town, the Garu, before 2030, right? So if we complete such a good, you know, project in the Garu, I believe the other local authority, including major cities like Surabaya and also Jakarta, may follow our project. And then our idea, the low carbon idea can be spread all across Indonesia, uh, you know, the, yeah, around the 2030. So that is the, our you know, final goal of this project, okay. So then the, yes, as I mentioned, it's a quite huge project, five year project uh, from this year, or well, yeah, slightly postponed. So therefore the official start probably next year. So then until 2026, a quite long project, five year project. And then the main counterpart is, as I mentioned, uh, yeah, Puskim, uh, Peu, and then the, together with the major uh, Indonesian, maybe your university also, are in, yeah, the included. Thank you very much. And then of course, including UPI, as you can see, 
And then the Japan side, yes, the, yeah, Hiroshima is the leader. And then the, together with other major also uh, Japanese universities, you know, the uh, top universities, as you can see. And, and together with the, yeah, the uh, Japanese companies like Panasonic and YKKAP and so on and so forth, as you can see here, right? And yeah, then, but anyway, so yeah, that's it. We have just started, so therefore the progress is small, but the, from here, yes, I'd like to, you know, the, share with you some of the ongoing progresses, okay? So anyway, so of course, as you know, that now that, yeah, the building sector is highly responsible for the low carbon, right? The, this is just, the, you know, the uh, figure from the IPCC report, right? The building sector accounts for approximately 20, at least 20% 20, 20 globally, or uh, in the case of Japan, the 30%, uh, yeah, the contribution in terms of the CO2 emissions. In the case of Indonesia, I believe that the more than 30%, right, if I'm mistaken, yeah, that more than 30% of the CO2 emissions come from the energy sector. So therefore, we are very resp highly responsible, needless to say, right? Low carbon is a must, needless to say. Low carbon building is a must nowadays needless to say. Okay, and then as I mentioned, now yes, the, all the countries, including developing countries, are now highly required to, you know, the, set the reduction target. Uh, yeah, the Paris Agreement. And then now that Mr. Biden <laughs> that became the president, so therefore the U US also will come back to the Paris Agreement, which is very, very good news for, for you know, environmental, you know, the, how to say, the, like, the researcher, but anyway. And then the, your country has yes, set the very ambitious target, as you know, then in, in uh, several years ago. And this is the Indonesian target. Right? With the condition, it's a very ambitious, yes, uh, you are going to reduce the emission uh, by 41% by 2030. Okay, without condition, yes, the 29% also ambitious. So this is the, yes, the, yeah, the Paris Agreement target. Right? So then now, you know, 2030 is not that far, needless to say. So now we need to think how to, you know, the really how to, how can we reduce, how can we achieve the, you know, this ambitious uh, reduction target in the building sector, right? Concretely, we need to understand. So how to do that? Uh, we need to, you know, the, right, the design, the, you know, the low carbon, uh, yeah, buildings. So that is our urgent need, right? And then the, yeah, the low carbon is important, right? But at the same time, you know, the, in the case of uh, in developing country, including probably Indonesia, the affordability is also still required, right? Because I, you know, the, uh, as I, if I'm not mistaken, the one of the still, you know, the biggest issues in housing sector in Indonesia is backlog right backlog right huge housing shortage right if i'm not mistaken you have a huge shortage of houses about 15 you know million right this was really a surprising figure actually so as i probably mentioned to you before that in the even in japan you know the, after the world war ii yeah we had a huge shortage of houses after the world war ii because uh, many cities were destroyed but the, this is re less than, you know, the Japanese, uh, yeah, the housing shortage was less than this number, actually. So this is more than the post-war, you know, the Japan era. It's a huge, you know, the backlog, actually, 50 million, right? So therefore, as you know, that the, now that, if I'm not mistaken, the Indonesian government is now trying to promote the affordable housing, right? Because, I, right, although you are now enjoying the, you know, economic growth, except for the corona, but the, then the you know, income level is increasing, increasing, but still not that, you know, the right, rich, right? The, yeah, now many people will become the middle class, but the lower middle class still, right? So therefore the, you know, affordability is so also still very important criteria, right, for us. So this means that, yes, we need to achieve the two things at the same time, right? So one is a low carbon. This is, we have already promised actually, that thanks to the Paris Agreement, right? So internationally, yeah, we need to, you know, the, uh, yeah, the cooperate, and then we need to achieve the low carbon, right? The low carbon is one, you know, one hand. 
And then the left hand side is yes, affordability. Also, yes, as I mentioned, that the, you know, we need to take care of the relatively poor people, new middle class, and so on and so forth. Right? Affordability is also, yes, is also important criteria. So we need to achieve the affordability and low carbon at the same time. Well, that's not that you know, easy, right? easy to say, but if we have a you know, huge budget, you know, the unlimited cost, the construction cost, we may be able to achieve the low carbon uh, relatively easily, right? For instance, we put the sophisticated techniques and so on and so forth, you know, the PV and then the everything, everything. So then we may be able to achieve the low carbon. But the, here, yes, the, we also need to consider affordability, right? We need to achieve the low carbon within the very limited cost, right? So that's an important challenge, right? And also important challenges needless to say, yes, the global warming. And then now the urban areas, especially, are warming and warming, right? So as I mentioned earlier, right? We are, yes, now we have, uh, we, we are receiving double punch, as I probably mentioned to you before. Yeah. One is the, yes, the global warming, right? The globally now temperature is rising and rising. Climate is changing and changing. That's a punch number one, right? Two, uh, punch number two is, yes, urban heat island, right? Particularly in urban areas, now the temperature is rising and rising because of the, not because of the global warming, but because of the urbanization, right? So now we receive the double punch. So therefore the, especially in urban areas, temperature is in, will be increased further and further, okay? So this is one example from our research result, okay? So the, in Hanoi, Hanoi, the Vietnam, the capital city, is uh, yeah, also just like Jakarta in a way, a huge city. Now, of course, it's smaller than Jakarta, but huge. The current population is uh, seven or uh, six million, as you can see here, already huge, you know, city. And then the, you know, the, well, in a way, just like, you know, Indonesia. So they are also plan to improve, increase the urban population further and further. So this is the blueprint of their government. And then according to their blueprint, you know, the, they plan to increase the urban population in Hanoi from 7 million to 9 million or 10 million by very short time, you know, 2030, right? So then the, this is very huge, you know, you have the expansion, right? And then the 1.5 times. Then our question is what will become of the urban temperature, you know, if they really implement this blueprint, if they really expand the city, you know, 1.5 times like this, uh, within the short period of time, you know, what will become of the urban temperature because of the double punch, right? Urbanization, um, urban heat island, and global warming, right? Very worried. And then we simulate the, you know, the predict the urban, you know, the temperature uh, due to the uh, increase due to the two, two double punches. This is the, you know, result. According to our si uh, simulation in Hanoi, Hanoi already hot, <laughs> as you know, but the, yes, the temperature will be increased by, according to our simulation, uh, two degrees Celsius or more, as you can see here, uh, during the peak hours, you know, surprising, you know, further, further more, right? Because I'm already hot. And then on top of the, you know, existing hot condition, so yeah, temperature will be increased by two degrees Celsius on top of that, right? Imagine, whoa, it's <laughs> extremely hot, right? So, but the, this is not the, you know, the, right, this is your matter also. I think that, you know, the, I do believe that, uh, we will predict that, uh, you know, Indonesian uh, major cities in this project, but the most probably the Indonesian major cities also will experience the similar temperature increase in the future, you know. So how to do this? Professor Tetsu Kubota. Okay. Uh, yeah, you have um, approximately uh, maybe nine minutes more. Oh, since okay. You have 36 slides, uh, so uh, you can make use the time uh, effectively. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, all right. okay. Then, anyway, so therefore, the, I believe that now we are facing the, you know, the three lemma, not, to, you know, the two issues, a uh, major three issues. We need to tackle the three problems at the same time. In, in the developing countries like you know, Indonesia. First of all, I think that we need to achieve the economic growth, right? Needless to say, this is, yes, we, we, yeah, we should achieve, first of all, because still we are growing, actually, right? 
So we cannot ignore, right? And but at the same time, we you need to tackle the you know the yeah the climate change, the mitigation. You need to achieve the low carbon, as I mentioned repeatedly. And at the same time, you know the temperature is increase and increase. So therefore, you should you should adapt to the changing climate. Adaptation is also needed, right? So you need to do that, not two things, three things at the same time. So that's a very tough, you know, era now, right? So trilemma. So now this is a big question: how to cope with, how to tackle the three, you know, major issues at the same time, trilemma, right? So that's a, I think, a very important point in the current, you know, uh, yeah, developing countries. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, the. Yeah, the, now in, in a way, partially in order to co yeah, the answer this question. So yes, now we uh, have just started a project. Okay, but the uh, because of time constraints, I, I just want to pick up one, you know, the yeah, the research topic, uh, number one, this, and then the, I just want to share with you the ongoing progress of a project. Okay, this one is actually uh, yeah the as you can see here the idea is to how to improve the you know the natural cross ventilation in the high rise you know Indonesian apartment Rusunami okay by using the vertical void so this is the topic huh? right so this is also the joint research project together with these universities including uh, Cambridge University also okay anyway so yeah the our target is Rusunami as you can see here. Right. Uh, yeah, the good apartment actually, but the still the you know the yeah the now you have the very strict you know the construction cost right construction cost is very limited, so therefore you cannot put the you know insulation and also the shading device and so on and so forth you know the you just you know the uh, prioritize the floor areas right so therefore the environmental quality is not that good right honestly speaking. And then the, uh, we are now focused on the ventilation, actually. So then the, uh, this is the, yeah, the interesting information from my you know, the former student, Andan. Right? So we collected many hundreds of drawings of Rusunami from uh, the developers in Jakarta, Bandung, and so on and so forth. And then we found that the most of the Rusunami apartment is so-called double loaded apartment. Right? So in the case of Japan, yes, actually the single loaded apartment is a majority. So this is because, uh, as you may know, if you come to Japan, I think you realize right, important is not that nearly summer, but the winter is in a way more important, right? So in order to receive the, you know, the low angle, uh, you know, the winter sun for heating, right? The most of the apartments are south oriented, you know, as you know, uh, in, uh, you know, Northern hemisphere, including Japan, right? We normally right the very carefully arrange the you know the uh, yeah the direction of the apartment in order to receive the you know the sunshine yeah during the winter months. So therefore yeah the southern oriented apartment is a majority. Right? So therefore the single road it is a uh, you know uh, yeah the majority. But in the case of Indonesia and in the tropics, uh, probably yeah, the you know sometimes sunshine is unwanted right. So therefore, you don't not very carefully, you know, the design, the orientation, right? So therefore, as a result, in order to increase the number of units and also the floor areas, the, yeah, the most of the apartment in Indonesia is this double loaded. In India also, actually, anyway, this, right? Double loaded apartment is, you know, the okay, it's good, you know, the yeah, economically efficient in a way because you, we can prepare the many many units, right? But the environmentally, especially ventilation performance is not necessarily good, right? Because uh, this double loaded, so therefore the yeah, the windward side of the apartment, yes, they can enjoy the ventilation if the wind comes from the left hand side to the right hand side. Yes, that these uh, windward side units enjoy the ventilation, right? But the leeward side of the units, right? Okay, okay, they cannot enjoy almost any, you know, the yeah, the ventilation, right? And then, as you know, that in Rusunami apartment, they tend to close doors, uh, corridor side, right? So therefore, the single sided ventilation, right? So therefore, the leeward side of the apartments, oh, okay, cross ventilation is very very poor, right? So then the, how can we improve the you know, cross ventilation, not only uh, windward side, 
but also especially leeward side of the you know double loaded apartment tsunami. So that's a very important research question. Okay. So then one straightforward way is probably to design the vertical void, as you can see here. Right. This is our proposal, actually. Right. So normally, uh, the, as you know, that the open void is a very, you know, the, yeah, the commonly used, but the, our proposal is, you no know, closed void. Yeah, it, this is very unique, actually. And then our, you know, idea is this. First, I think that, yeah, as you know, in Indonesia, also in Malaysia also, actually, the most of the apartment have uh, piloty space, right, on the ground, yeah, ground level, right? And then the, this PLT space is very interesting, actually. So basically, as you know, wind speed is very low near the ground level, as you know, right, of course, right? But the exception is PLT, actually. PLT, no exception. Actually, the wind speed is very high. Why? Because of the, yeah, the venturi effect, actually, right? So that if the wind hits the surface of the building, right, uh, some of the wind goes up and some of the wind goes down, as you know, right? And then the sum of the wind goes down towards the, yeah, the ground floor. And then if you have a PLT space, so then the, uh, at the in, uh, inlet of the you know, PLT space, the so-called venturi effect happens. So therefore, the, you know, the, because the wind, is, wind comes not only here, but also from the upper part of the apartment. So therefore, the, yes, the, here the wind speed increases uh, thanks to the venturi effect, right? And so therefore the wind speed yeah, in the PLT space is not necessarily weak. Yeah, yeah, rather, you know, very high. Okay. And then our idea is to make use of this increased wind speed. And then we put the wind catcher here. And then we further increase the uh, uh, wind pressure, air pressure inside of the void, right? And then the imagine now that, you know, the uh, wind pressure, air pressure inside of the void is now positive, not negative, positive. And here the you know the uh, uh, air pressure is negative. Here positive, here negative. So therefore the these you know the uh, yeah leeward side of the apartments can enjoy the cross ventilation from left left hand side to right hand side. Right, interesting, right? So this is the idea actually. Uh, quite unique, right? And then this is the ordinary you know the yeah idea. This is our new idea. Uh, ordinary idea is yes, the open void, as I probably mentioned. This is also interesting, you know, the commonly used, as you may know. So the idea of this open void, you know, ventilation is this. So yeah, as I mentioned, if the building, you know, that receive the wind from left hand side to right hand side, uh, as he, uh, shown here. So uh, okay, here is the positive, you know, pressure region, right? Here, negative pressure lesion, needless to say. And interestingly, here also negative pressure lesion, uh, yeah, the, is created, right? So therefore, here negative. So therefore, the, here also negative pressure lesion. So therefore, the, yeah, the, thanks to this, you know, the negative pressure lesion, this kind of upward, upward wind is generated, right, the naturally, right? This is not uh, due to the temperature difference, actually. Right. And then the, thanks to this upward wind, yeah, the leeward side of the units also can enjoy the small cross ventilation from right hand side to left hand side. Okay, so that's a mechanism of this, you know, ordinary open void, you know, the concept. Okay, our concept is, as I mentioned, completely different, right? Here, you know, the, yes, negative pressure. Here, positive pressure uh, is expected. And then the, this kind of cross ventilation can happen. So this is our idea. Okay. So let's take a look. You know, the, which is better, right? In terms of the cross ventilation uh, on the leeward side of the apartment. Okay. And then we carry out the yeah the wind tunnel experiments uh, in Japan, Niigata, and also we uh, conducted the very detailed simulation, right? Simulation results was, you know, the carefully validated by using the result of wind, ex uh, wind tunnel experiments. And then after the validation, uh, we conducted, uh, you know, the, yeah, the systematically, the parametric study for, uh, for the two design. Uh, type A design is the ordinary open void, as I mentioned. And then the type B is our new proposal, which is closed, you know, vertical void, as you can see here, here closed. And then here, wind catcher. Okay, so this indicates that you know the uh, wind pressure, uh, wind pressure distribution, right? The 
uh, negative value indicates the blue, and then the positive values, yeah, red. Okay. So then the, yeah, as expected, as you can see here. So in the ordinary, you know, the apartment, uh, in this case, yes, here the positive region, pressure region. Here negative, of course, yes. Right? Here also negative, interestingly, as you may know. And then, the, you know, therefore, the inside of the void also negative, right? Interesting. So that's an ordinary apartment. Here is a new idea. Okay, the all right, the positive pressure region is as expected, is created inside of the void, interestingly. So therefore, the, you know, the wind, wind speed distribution is this. The river side also, yes, a type A ordinary apartment, uh, they enjoy the small speed of the, you know, the uh, yeah, cross ventilation on the river side of the apartment. Here, yes, as you can see here, the yeah, new design, the you know, wind speed is slightly higher than that of the ordinary design, as you can see here, thanks to our new system. Okay, uh, this is the detail of the wind flow inside of the units, the, you know, the uh, wind world side, river side, uh, the ordinary, you know, apartment, the new proposal, right? Uh, here, the yeah, wind speed is higher than that of the ordinary design, okay? So then the, uh, ma still in progress, right? The, but anyway, so the, this is the yeah, result of the uh, ventilation rate. Uh, this is the windward units, reward units. The ordinary design is the type A, uh, you know, the light gray, and dark gray is the uh, yeah, result of a new proposal, type B. The, yeah, in conclusion, uh, shortly, okay, the river, uh, windward side of the apartment, windward side, okay, the, yeah, the type A is better, as you can see in terms of the ventilation rate, but the reward side of the apartments, yeah, as expected, yeah, our new design, type V, yes, that is much better that of, than that of the, you know, the ordinary apartment. So, uh, right, so this is the you know, ongoing result. Interesting, right? So this means that if you want to improve, especially the, you know, the cross ventilation, especially for the river side of the apartment, our new proposal is in a way um, can be better option. Okay, so this one is also probably interesting you know, result. So this is also the part of our project and then the, yeah, the still we haven't yet progressed, uh, how to say, that started, but the, this is uh, the, some progress of the previous project. Anyway, so if you are interested in, please take a look at, uh, you know, this no? slides after the presentation. Anyway, so then anyway, so now we have constructed already one, you know, the, yes, the first experimental house in Tegado by making use of these research results. Okay, this is the concept. And then these are the, uh, this is the, uh, yeah, the full-scale experimental house that we constructed in Tegal, okay, together with, the, you know, the Indonesian, you know, partners, okay, counterparts, okay. Yeah, the, I think that, yeah, uh, you, maybe you can find some friends, uh, Indonesian friends, uh, your friends in, in the pictures. So this is the mayor of the Tegal, and then the, some gentleman came, kindly came from uh, Peru, and then also Puskin member, and then the YKKP member and so on and so forth, right? So we have, yeah, unfortunately we cannot, you know, the, we couldn't go to, uh, you know, the opening ceremony because of Corona, but the, yeah, the fortunately, yes, the opening ceremony was successfully uh, hold, uh, yeah, as scheduled in March, okay? So this is the, uh, yeah, the, okay, yes, the, okay, inside of the, yeah, the apartment constructed, Right, so just like we simulated, so we designed the courtyard, uh, void space, sorry, inside. This is closed void, right? And then the, we put the wind fin here. So then the, this was designed especially by the Itebe team, actually, the Professor Devi and uh, her students, the very, you know, the, yeah, yeah. And this, then uh, together with Hiroshima University and Puskin, okay. And then the, uh, all right. So this is also inside and uh, okay, very beautiful. And then the, now because of Corona, so now this has not been occupied actually, but the, after the Corona, so the, yeah, the, this will be occupied and then we, will, uh, we are going to do the, yeah, the field experiment by using this, you know, the experimental house. So please come to this experimental house really after the Corona, 
right? So then, the, so that you can, uh, you know, the, yeah, uh, enjoy it and then the experience the, uh, yeah, the resulting, you know, the thermal conditions inside of the, you know, our apartment, okay? So this is the project and then the five-year project. So I will go to, you know, frequently go to Indonesia. So after Corona, so the, let's, you know, the meet again in Indonesia. Right. Thank you very much. Sorry for the, oh yeah, I'm sorry, explain it. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much, Professor uh, Kubota for the uh, nice uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, now the, quiz, uh, the question and answer sessions. Uh, we have been, uh, uh, we have, uh, obtain uh, several uh, questions, uh, mm -hmm. please uh, uh, the host to show the questions. Uh, this is from uh, Mr. Frankie Benedictus. Oh, oh. oh ah, okay. Hey, which one? Okay, from uh, Frankie Benedictus first. Uh, how much influence does climate have uh, an efforts to achieve thermal comfort and energy consumption? when compared to other factors that also affect it. Whether climate can be categorized as the main variable that needs to be reviewed in the early phases of the design process, uh, building oh. safe design, for example. Uh, thank you. Yeah, okay, very more perfect question. It's a, oh yeah, especially when we talk about the passive design, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, the most important influential factor is the climate, right? Because uh, well, that's a very perfect question. Thank you very much for your question. Mm. So therefore, now, yes, the climate team, now, now they try to uh, classify the you know, Indonesian country into some climatic zones, actually. So as you know that, the, yes, the, in the case of Japan, so we classified Japan archipelago into five or six you know, the climatic zones. And then the, each of the climatic zone has its own different energy saving standards. Right, because I needless to say, you know, the energy saving standard should be different depending on the background condition, background climatic conditions, right? We should do the same in Indonesia also. But in the case of, Indo in the case of Japan, you know, the, yeah, actually the Indonesia and Japan, very, you know, there are many similarities, right? Uh, yeah, huge population size is, of course, much, much bigger. But the, the very important difference is Japan is, you know, large, from north to south, right? so therefore the climatic condition is very very different, you know, from Hokkaido to you know Okinawa Island, for instance, right? In the case of Indonesia, looks you know similar, right? You know Papua and Tilda, you know Sumatra, for instance, right? The temperature-wise probably similar, but the, if we take a look at the detail, right? Uh, uh, of course, as you know, the yeah the weather conditions can be different, right? especially in terms of the wind condition and then the precipitation, rain condition, different, right? This can be also important for our passive design, right? So therefore, yes, by, uh, you know, the considering these condition, not only temperature, but also wind condition, precipitation and so on and so forth. Now, yes, the climate team, our climate team, uh, try to classify the uh, Indonesian climate uh, into several climatic zones, right? And then we try to propose the, you know, passive design for each of the climatic zones, right? Considering the local climate. So that is the, yes, our, you know, idea. But anyway, the, yeah, the straightforward answer to you is, oh, yes, that's very, very agreeable. The climate is the most important criteria and the factor that, right, that need to be considered. And then, as I mentioned, also, now we are talking about the future, right? So, yeah, in the 2030, very short term, actually, very soon, but probably, yes, urban temperature will be changed, right? So, therefore, if we want to propose the new passive design, new idea for the future in Indonesia, we also need to understand, predict the future, you know, climate of Indonesia. So, therefore, yes, we, by doing the you know, the, yeah, the new simulation, right? So now we are, uh, we, going, we are going to predict the, you know, urban temperature, urban climate of Indonesia, you know, at the beginning of this project. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah, in, in, good, good question. Number two, number two. Next questions. Uh, okay. Uh, from Cynthia, mm -hmm. uh, Miss, uh, Miss 
Cynthia Wu Sang mm-hmm. about reevaluate the traditional building vernacular architecture oh. in terms of thermal comfort and low carbon. Mm-hmm. As we know that traditional building, mainly traditional housing, has been built sustainably and adapted mm-hmm. to local condition based mm-hmm. on local knowledge. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, what is your opinion or response for this? Yeah, yeah, mo, but perfectly agree actually. So then the, again in in the project also yes, uh, we try to uh, look at the not only modern houses but also traditional vernacular houses, and then we try to pick up the you know interesting design tips uh, from the vernacular design, vernacular architecture in Indonesia, and try to apply them into the yes the mm, the modern houses. Yeah. I also actually I have experience of doing so in Malaysia also. Malaysia, yes, I have been to uh, yeah Malaysia for some time. So therefore, yes, uh, yeah, at the time, yes, we also investigated the vernacular houses, including in Malaysia, Malay house and also the Chinese shop house. And then yeah, it was very interesting actually. And then we you know the conducted the field measurement in these vernacular houses, and the, you know the, after finding the interesting design tip, we try to pick up them and then try to you know the, apply them to the yeah the modern houses. But here yes, the two things are important actually. Yeah, it's easy to say. Of course, you know that we first of all I agree, and then hundred percent we should learn the local wisdom from the you know vernacular houses this is 100% true but the important considerations uh, maybe there are two points number one is uh, you know that it looks beautiful perfect right but the actually you know the vernacular houses you know vernacular traditional building technique is good but the if you pick up only one of the you know one of the technique from the you know a uh, vernacular house and then try to in, you know, the apply this into the modern houses, this doesn't work. Uh, because each of the technique is very, very tiny, actually. Uh, for instance, you know, the vernacular houses, they have many, many techniques, right? So as a whole building system, you know, this vernacular technique will do. And then the, sometimes, you know, very good, right? But the, if you pick up only one of the techniques, Right, this technique itself is very, very tiny. You cannot find in any effect. So this means that the vernacular techniques is good as a whole system, not as a single technique. Right, that's all a very interesting point actually. Right, it's, uh, that number two is also that our demand is di- di- different. Right, okay. I, I don't know who, who you are actually, but the, do you can you bear? The you know traditional vernacular condition now, for instance, if you are forced to move on to the move into the vernacular house from tomorrow, right? Do you can you bear? Right? Because you you now you already experienced a very comfortable modern life, right? Air conditioning and so on and so forth. So therefore, the, your requirement is different from that of the you know the vernacular people, right? Traditional old you know old people, right? So therefore, your demand is very high. So therefore, that even if you live in the vernacular house now, probably you cannot be satisfied. Right? So this is also important point number two. But anyway, thank you very much for your question. <laughs> thank you very much. For <laughs> okay. okay, next question. We have two more questions. Oh. Uh, uh, from Randy Perdana Hitmat. Uh, mm-hmm. We definitely use EPW file from historical metadata. data. Some area are, oh. are provided and some uh, done. So we use the proxy or representative as you mentioned before, Singapore oh. or for simulating Indonesian's needs. So hmm. how exactly the way to predict future situation in your opinion? There's the tool called urban weather generator. Uh, is it similar to what you work and uh, your team work on recently in your climate team? Okay, thank you very much. I am not so familiar with the EPW, I'm sorry to say, and to my shame, but the, in our team, yes, uh, we, are, we normally use the, you know, the commonly used, you know, the sophisticated, uh, yeah, the numerical modeling, which is so-called WAF. Uh, WAF means W, R, yes, uh, yeah, F, the weather, 
uh, <laughs> the weather research and forecasting. I'm sorry, WAF. So we, this is very commonly used. You know the uh, very advanced. You know the numerical climatic modeling. Uh, commonly used in the field of uh, meteorological something something actually uh, even bm kage for instance they are using this you know the modeling work uh, to predict the and then the you know can be probably they use it for the uh, weather report i believe um, so anyway so now please take a look at the paper so about the work number one and then the uh, in order to predict the future urban climate, yes, the first, I think the two things are important. Right? First, I think we need to pre predict the future land use or land cover, right? Because, uh, you know, the, in order to, uh, you know, the predict the urban climate, two in, uh, there are two in, very important input data, right? Number one is a land use, land cover data, okay, right? And then number two is the, you know, the global weather data. Right. So then by inputting the two data, we normally you know, simulate the climatic conditions. I think you can understand, right? right? So therefore, if we want to predict the future climatic conditions, right, you need to input the two data. One is future land cover or land use data, and also future global climatic data. Right? Global climatic data, actually, normally we cannot predict. So normally we use the given data. So you know many many you know the, right, the IPCC and so on so forth. They provide right, the yeah the global modeling, uh, climatic modeling, and then normally we uh, make use of their you know the yeah global climatic modeling data uh, given by the IPCC. Right? That's number one. Number two is yes, as I said, right. That we need to predict the land use, land cover, you know future land use, land cover. Right. In the case of Hanoi that we conducted, right? So yeah, that we make use of the you know master plan, right? Because uh, you know the I think that Jakarta, for instance, they they should have the master plan, right? The master future master plan for 2030 or 2020, I don't know, or maybe 2050, right? So then I think that can be used for the prediction. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. The last question. Okay. Uh, also from Randy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is more affordable features do you mean? Uh, mm -hmm. If the targeted object is the public housing that most mm -hmm. likely to be designed with minimum facility, sometimes also assisted by the shortage of energy supply, for instance, electricity cut off due to the lack of public energy management and services. Mm -hmm. Except your project is targeting uh, the middle and to high economic class apartments. Uh, that is always the contradiction that I have been thinking so far when comparing developed and developing country. Thank you. Uh, no, no, okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, you know, uh, this is my motto. Yeah, I would like to contribute to the majority of the people, majority of the people, right? For instance, uh, sometimes, you know, the researchers tend to, you know, the propose the very sophisticated, you know, the, you know, the design or something, you know, which is sometimes far from the reality, right? This is perfect, you know, right? Then the, yeah, in a way, as a top runner, this is good, you know, the you know, achievement in a way, but the, yeah, the, it's sophisticated, but the people, ordinary people cannot enjoy such, uh, you know, sophisticated, expensive, you know, technologies or techniques, right? I don't like these kind of things, right? I really want to approach directly, contribute to the majority of ordinary people, right? So this is for me, affordability, right? So I want to produce together with, you know, Indonesian team and then uh, propose, develop the, you know, affordable techniques, affordable housing, you know, uh, that ordinary people, most of the people can enjoy, right? So that is for me affordable, right? So therefore, the, I have to say, yeah, the, then but again, so we are now we are talking about the future. So, right? so now, as you know, that the middle class of in Indonesia is growing and growing, you know, the, in 1990s, zero. But now the middle class percentage is about 40 or 50%. And then according to the statistics, by 2030, the middle class in Indonesia will become 
100% surprisingly. Okay. So then, the, you know, first, I think we need to predict the income level of the future middle class in Indonesia, right? How much income they will earn <laughs> in 2030, including you, probably, right? We need to predict first. And then, you know, the, we need to set the, you know, the construction cost, you know, in line with the, you know, the income level of the majority of the middle class people in the future Indonesia, right? And then within this limit, uh, we should propose and develop the, you know, the yeah, low carbon techniques. Right? So that is uh, what we are going to do, actually. Did I answer his question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, because of time limitation, uh, so if you have further questions, you can ask directly to oh. what uh, sensor emails. Uh, so uh, let close the session. Mm. Uh, this is the end of the plenary session in room one. Uh, thanks to the audience that had participated actively, uh, invited speakers and distinguished guests. Uh, let's close the session with uh, Hamdallah, Alhamdulillah Alamin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just for your information, we still have the keynote session two with Professor Andreas Matsaragis from Research Center Human Biometeorology of the German Meteorological Service in Freiburg. The session will start at uh, 1 p.m. Until then, you may have your lunch break. Uh, so let's, let's meet again at 1 p.m. at keynote session two in this uh, Zoom link Zoom. As the, moderator, as the moderator, including master of ceremony, thanks invited speaker, and all audience entirely, including the committee, uh, may, may what we had conducted will be useful for us. If in guidings, even in uh, if I have uh, made mistake, please uh, forgive me. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. And for Kubota Sensei, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yes. So let's meet again at 1 p.m. Uh, so you can have a lunch break uh, and please come again in this uh, link Zoom. Thank you very much. So uh, I will uh, uh, leave uh, this uh, meeting room and, and uh, you can uh, have your lunch break. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.